Hey, welcome back, everybody. Sorry, I got to reply to this right now. I got a Home Depot Pro text that I have to approve. There we go. Welcome back, all you beautiful bulletproof handyman and women to the bulletproof handyman business channel. Uh, today, uh, I don't know if y'all, by the way, if you like the thumbnail, just so you know, AI made that. I preach AI on here a lot. I think it's a tool out of many tools that we need to learn how to use in any business, including a handyman business. And that was done by one simple prompt and then one more prompt to just simply tell the AI to change one little thing that I didn't like, and boom, it made that thumbnail. I think it's beautiful. Anyways, here we are. So today's Howdy Handyman. Mark, how you doing, sir? Is my audio good? So I'm going to get into uh, what we're going to be talking about today. This is This is handyman business related, but it's not so much about the business as it is the mindset that leads up to the business. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Uh, so the subject is, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with um, The Man in the Arena. It's a speech by Teddy Roosevelt, and it's something that I didn't actually, so I've believed a lot of what he says in this speech most of my life. I've had some quotes from some other people that sort of backed that up and helped spur me on, but I really liked this one. I discovered it just last year. I imagine half of y'all have probably known about it for a while. So I'm just going to read it to you, first of all, and then I'm going to talk about it. And then we may go back into reading little pieces of it to dive into them further. But before I even talk about it, let me just read the actual quote from his speech. So he says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So I want y'all to, to listen to that and maybe look it up on your own and read it. And, you know, there's a few YouTubers uh, that have just read that with much better voices, better orators than I. Um, but it's something that if you can remind yourself of it every now and then, it's going to give you a little bit of a boost because what it reminds you of, you know, for example, I'm running this YouTube channel. I get tons of, if y'all read through the comments on some of my videos, there are a lot of people who hate me just for being a handyman who makes good money, for nothing more than that. Um, and those don't typically get to me because I know what my priorities are. My priorities are providing for my family. That is my number one priority from now until the rest of my life. They will always be my family. It will always be my job to provide, and I will never be apologizing for helping to provide for them. <laughs> But there's some things in here that I, I really want to point out, which is, oh, and what I was getting around to, sorry, I do stumble around a lot, guys. I hope y'all don't have too much of a problem following me. I know I sort of get off track. I do eventually come back. But if you can just sort of remind yourself of every now and then, read it or listen to it, it's a good reminder when you have a lot of people who are not on your side. You may have homeowners or property managers who are upset at you and saying that you're gouging them or charging too much. And you may be, don't do that. You know, like you need to figure out your numbers and you need to be charging the right price, not just what you can get away with today. Cause today you can get away with a lot more than what you'll be able to get away with in the long run. And what you want to be is that stable rock that they can just go to over and over and get a reliable service from. But yeah, the speech I think is a good reminder. And here's the reason that it's a good reminder is let's see so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat that's a big deal guys you're the ones in the arena if you are in the arena then you're the one in the arena and it's not you know starting at the beginning it's not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better you're the one that's doing it. You're the one that's trying. You're the one that stepped into the arena 
And there are going to be a lot of people who just have a lot of criticisms of you. And this is what you remind yourself of. And this is what you can tell them to their face. I tell it to people all the time. I just say, hey, you know what? I'm the one in the arena. Sorry you don't like what I'm doing. Sorry you don't like what I'm saying. Sorry you don't like what I'm preaching. But guess what? I'm the guy in the arena. If you don't like what I'm saying, start your own YouTube channel and start telling everybody what you think. But I don't think you're going to. Why? Because you're over here commenting a bunch of negative stuff on my channel. I don't have time to go peruse everyone's channels leisurely, find everything I think they're wrong about, and then send them nasty comments telling them how evil they are and how they're ripping people off or whatever it is that I disagree with that they have to say. I don't have time for it because I'm too busy being in the arena. So now here's what we're going to talk about. Hey, oh, actually, yeah, this is exactly what we're going to talk about. Actually, I'm going to wait a second, but just so y'all know, um, um, Lee, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your last name already, uh, but Lee from The Handyman Journey, it looks like he's in here. Uh, we had a nice conversation this morning, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my opinion of Lee here in a minute. <laughs> but when Alan Lee, sorry, that's right, Alan Lee, I remembered Lee instead of Alan. So here's the deal, guys. To say that you are in the arena, right, to make that claim, to proclaim yourself, I'm the man in the arena, to say that is to say simply that you have chosen to step in the arena. It's not a, a cocky or an arrogant statement if you have stepped into the arena, because it is not to say I'm the best. It is not to say I have succeeded. It is not to say that I will succeed. It says nothing more than I've chosen to step into the arena and you can step into the arena and fail and you can also step into the arena and succeed but never forget if you've chosen to step into the arena you're the one in the arena all the people around you who have whatever they have to say about what you're doing and if you're doing it right and how you should do it different or how you shouldn't even be trying to do it at all they're not in the arena it's you and it's whatever challenge it is that you've accepted. It doesn't have to be starting a handyman business either. It can be anything in the world that you've chosen to do that's harder than the usual. And this is the great thing about it, is if you want to be the man in the arena, the title of this video is How to Be the Man in the Arena. It's the easiest thing in the world, guys. You just step into the arena. The instant you step in, you are in the arena. If y'all are trying to start a handyman business and... The very first step you need to take is coming up with your business name. And by coming up with your business name, I don't mean sitting around and daydreaming and coming up with some neat ideas. I mean, setting aside the time, sitting down seriously and saying, OK, the first step is making my business name. I'm going to devote this time. The next 30 minutes, I'm going to come up with my business name, or at least I'm going to devote the entire 30 minutes to a serious effort to come up with that business name. If that's what you're doing. Right now, if you sit down when this video is over and you just simply take a step, whatever that step is, you've placed yourself in the arena. You are now the man in the arena and you can go back to this quote and you can read it and you can remind yourself no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody thinks, they're not in the arena. You are. It's like, uh, where did I say? Oh, let me go over some comments real quick. There's a lot of them. You guys are quick today. Hexa said, uh, yo, buddy, yo, what's up? Hexa Construction, I'm glad you like the quote. Handyman Mark said, you're stumbling, you're stumbling play well with my ADHD, and that's honestly what it is for me. I'm pretty sure I'm like a touch, a touch of autism, a little bit of Asperger's in there as well, which I think is generally a good thing. It's, it's helped me out in life anyways, uh, but that's good to know. We both got the ADHD, so <laughs> we kind of enjoy going all over the place. Handyman Journey said, haters are going to hate. And that's what I was looking for is that comment. Haters going to hate. That's always been the case. That always will be the case. There will never be a time in your life where you're trying to do something above and beyond and there's nobody hating on it. It's never going to happen. You're the man in the arena. Don't listen to them. Uh, Brian said, in all the years of doing field service, I have learned that what commercial customers want most is show up when you say you will and just be better than the last guy. That's not hard to do. That's been a lesson I've been teaching on this channel for a while is follow through. You would be amazed. You, you'll be better than nine out of 10 handymen if the only thing you do is follow through with what you said you were going to do. 
If you do nothing more than that, you say you're going to do something and then you actually do it and you make a habit of that so that it's expected. People just assume that it will get done the way you said it will get done because you follow through. That will literally put you in the top 10th percentile in this business. Brian said small talk helps too with customers. It does. It can um, probably more so with homeowners, which is something I'm going to be getting around to as homeowners in a minute. Um, small talk can help with customers. Uh, my property managers, they're busy. They don't want to spend any more time on the phone with me than they need to. And I'm in the same boat as them. And the tenants, uh, I mean, some of them are great conversation. Typically, I'm trying to get in and out. But yes, if you're talking homeowners, for sure, they do like that connection. And small talk is a good way to get that connection. Hexa Construction said these days, just be a professional and not a complete dirtbag. And people like to do business with you. Yeah, exactly, man. That's the same as that following through. Like you just be a solid, reliable handyman and you're in the top 10th percentile right off the bat. Uh, Hexa said everything is about relationships. Business relationships are one of them. I agree with that 100 percent. Brian said, guys, give the video a like. I think that's an outstanding idea, Brian. I should give my own video a like. Uh, first name, last name said INTP ADHD autism here. I took that test once. I don't recall. Uh, I feel like I was an INTJ and an ENTJ, depending on what day I took the test. But there's some some very useful stuff going on there. Builder Breaker Remaker. I like that name. He said, I appreciate your insight. I'm in the far west Phoenix Valley. I have extended family who closed on a home a couple weeks ago that took a chance on myself and them on me. Just invoiced a bit over 4K. That's very nice, man. I hope you did a good job for him. I'm sure you did. And Roberto said hi. All right, so we're going to continue on with this video now. Uh, one of the things I wanted to get around to was... I told y'all that Alan Lee was in here from the Handyman Journey, and he and I had a conversation on the phone this morning, a really pleasant conversation. I don't know how long it lasted, but I'll bet it was longer than it felt because it was just a really nice conversation. And in the past, I've been asked about him, and I don't believe I've ever had anything bad to say about him as a person. However, I haven't recommended his channel, and the reason I haven't recommended his channel is because my channel has always been focused on stay away from homeowners and work for property managers. That's how you get bulletproof. That's how you get work orders that just roll in all the time. Um, so to be clear, it was never anything against him. It was just the idea that his channel was focused on homeowners, which also focuses on marketing. And my channel is focused on property managers and really zero marketing. However, we had a conversation this morning and you would be absolutely amazed how much in the same boat he and I are. We, we run our businesses not the same way, but the philosophy behind how we make our business decisions and where we take our business and how we view the industry, what we hope for for the future of the industry. Honestly, the only difference that I can see between me and him at the moment is just simply that he's chosen a particular path and I've chosen a particular path and they're not the same path. But outside of them not being the same path, our businesses really run almost identical. Well, I shouldn't say identical to each other, but I feel like you could take my model and you could take his model and you could overlap them. And it would only take very little tweaking to just make them fit right in with each other. So uh, what happened was he did a video um, and I don't know exactly what spurred the comment, but one of his viewers responded to him in a comment and said, Hey, you should check out the Bulletproof Handyman. So he did. And he was previously in the boat that a lot of handymen are in, which is one of the reasons I made my channel. He was in the boat of, he had some bad experiences with property managers. And because of those bad experiences, he's essentially written them off. Not that he's written them off completely, but he just, he, he basically became someone very typical in the handyman world who says property managers kind of suck. I'm going to focus on homeowners. Well, he watched one of my videos and he liked a few things I had to say, but most importantly, he had an open mind. He actually listened to what I had to say, and he started thinking to himself, hey, you know what? I feel like maybe this is one of those areas where I can be a little bit more open-minded about things and maybe expand some business and grow the business. And this is what I'm getting around to is, so Alan Lee has been doing this for six years now. He started his business six years ago. That's a long time, guys, to be running a business. 
And he's doing well now, but he worked his ass off to get to the point that he's doing well now. He went through all the same trials and tribulations I did, all the same ones that you did if you've made it, and all the same ones that you will if you haven't made it yet. There is a lot of challenge ahead of you if you're not there yet. And Alan Lee's been doing this for six years, and he's not done. And that's the crazy thing, because it takes a lot out of you to be in the arena. And yes, you can step out of the arena. You can take a vacation to Costa Rica. You know, you can do a lot of things to get out of that arena to do a little bit of a reset. But in the end, if you're in the arena, once you've really put yourself in and that's what you're doing, it's very hard to separate from it. You can't just climb over the fence and pretend like none of that over there exists. It's, it's necessary to put in the effort to because that's what your family needs from you. It's what your friends, it's what your community needs from you. But um, he's six years in and he's still in the arena. We were discussing, it's, it's not my business to tell y'all anything that he was discussing in terms of his future plans for his business. But suffice to say, he's still in the arena. Not only is he still in the arena, but he's still looking for new horizons and he's still putting in all of that effort and I respect the heck out of that. So uh, what I would like you all to do, if and when you have the chance, is to go check out the Handyman Journey. I linked him in the description of this video. Specifically, the videos of his that I like the best that I think you'll find most useful, regardless of which path you take, is he does a lot, a lot of videos on the business side of things. And when I say business side, I mean figuring out your pricing and taxes and things like that. There's a lot that goes on here. You know, I say it all the time. Anybody can learn how to swap a toilet. I could take a 14-year-old high school kid, and if I took him with me for a month, he'd be a handyman at the end of the month when it comes to the work, right? The tools are not hard to learn how to use. The work is not hard to learn how to do. What's hard is figuring out what a business is and how to run a business. And by no means am I the professional. You know, I'm not. If I was, I would be a millionaire already. And if I look around... I don't see no million bucks. So I know for a fact that I can't be right about everything. But what I can say is that the hardest part of this business is the business part. It's the logistics. It's the planning. It's the tooling. It's the finances. It's all of those things. And Alan Lee, despite his business being a very different model from mine, it's also very much the same kind of model. And everything that he has to say about running the business is 100% going to be applicable to you guys. So I just wanted to give him a shout out because I'm just really excited about the conversation we had this morning. There's a lot in common and we have various, a very similar vision as to the future of the handyman business. Let's go to some more comments. Trevor said, make the first small step of answering a few requests on next door. No work from it, that, but that small act made me feel better. That's awesome. Handyman journey uh, left a, oh, oh, Wow, I was seeing that GIF all wrong. Cool. Um, he said, I'm starting Canon Proof Handyman. <laughs> Good luck with Canon Proof, man. Uh, handyman Mark is laughing. Handyman Journey said, you have to constantly be adapting, and that's correct. So that's going to lead me, uh, let me... Let me finish the comments first. I get too distracted too easy. Manuel Arno said, I was watching old videos and see we're live. Thanks. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you're here, Manuel. <sighs> Hexa said, my business has done well based on logistics and customer service. And that's really so much about what this is about. It really is. Hexa also said, there are others better than me, but that's not why my customers, what my customers go on about. It's mainly about service as 100% true, 100% true. So here's also where some things are going. And I'm going to get back into the, the man in the arena thing as well. Like we're going to dive deeper into that if y'all care to stick around for that. Like I said, it's not so much handyman business related, but to me, the philosophy that led me to do what I do should be as important as the actual things that I do. Because if you understand the philosophy, then you don't need me. You know what I mean? So Alan opened up his mind. Alan, Alan was stuck in a, I don't work for property managers mindset. And he opened up his mind. And because of opening up his mind, I'm super excited to I, I really I want to vomit everything I know about property managers onto him so that he has it all because there are so many nuances there. There are 
things about working for property managers that are not necessarily true of homeowners. Some of them are even the opposite. And there's some rules. And if you go back through all my videos, it's all there. But he doesn't have time to go watch 100 videos. I'm literally excited to just vomit all this information onto him, as gross as that sounds. That's what I want to do. I want to get it all out. And I want to make sure he has it before he interacts with them too much so that he can sort of start off on the right foot. In exchange for that, after watching his video that he posted today where he talked about my channel and he talked about opening up his mind and expanding some horizons and being adaptable, it immediately made me realize, and the guys, this is something I'm guilty of constantly. If y'all ever want to accuse me of being a little bit arrogant and a little bit cocky, 100%. It's a roller coaster for me. Here's what happens. I get cocky. I get arrogant. Something happens. I crash down. When I crash down, luckily, it's never been a bad crash. It's always been because I am fairly bulletproof. It's never anything that I can't get over. But during that lull, I rethink a lot of things and I realize, ah, yeah, I put in a lot of estimates that were a little higher. They all got approved. I knocked them out like one after another after another. I kicked ass. And I started getting pumped up and full of confidence. And there's nothing wrong with that. You should be proud of yourself. If you do things that are worthy of being proud of, it's not a bad thing to be proud of yourself. But ultimately, if you do too many of those too many times in a row, and if you maybe just get a little bit lucky for a little bit too long, you start getting cocky, you start getting arrogant, and your mind starts closing off because you realize, ah, I've got it all figured out. And I'm not immune from that, guys. You're not immune from it either. If you think you are, I promise you, you're not. And I'm definitely not. So here's what I'm going to do is Alan has offered to give me some advice on working for homeowners. Now, right at this very moment, I can't expand out to homeowners because right at this very moment, I have the handymen that I have to work for me. And I have myself and I have my other responsibilities like my family and all of you beautiful people here on YouTube. I cannot expand out to homeowners yet because my current issue is more work than workers. However, I'm going to start letting him talk to me. I'm going to start gaining advice from him and actually learning, you know, I swore off homeowners for the same reason that he swore off property managers. I had enough bad experiences and I decided that my family deserves something more stable. And I decided to go into property management because I saw a huge opportunity there, but more so because I saw a more stable opportunity. So I'm going to be talking to Alan now. And as I give him a little bit of what I can give him to help him out with the property managers. He's going to give me some stuff on homeowners. And I feel like if y'all will listen to his channel and his advice and listen to my channel and my advice, you're almost certainly going to find areas that we don't agree on. There may be areas we never agree on. I don't know if there are yet because we haven't had that much time to discuss anything, but I know we're on the same page and I know that you'll find a lot of overlaps and those overlaps are where it's at because running a handyman business, regardless of who your client is, I think 90% of the, the things that are going to lead to success, the decisions that are going to lead to success, the mindsets that are going to lead to success, I think 90% of those are going to be transferable between homeowners and property managers, as well as commercial work and real estate agents, all types of fields. There's a lot to do out here. Um, but yeah, so I just I would like to humbly thank Alan for his video, for his mention of me, for for all of that for being open-minded and also especially for being open-minded and honest enough to remind me that I may not have been as open-minded and honest as I need to be. So we're going to see sort of what's in the future for this, but I'm excited to talk to him more and to get to learning more about what he's doing. Let's do some comments again. Handyman Journey, Alan said, uh, you have to be constantly adapting and that is 100% correct. Oh, wait. I started a little further back. We already did that. Where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? The Covenant Homestead. Okay, uh, if you're really a homestead, do me a favor. Shoot me an email at bulletproofhandymanbusiness at gmail.com. Uh, I am going to be three to five years from now, let's say. I do have a plan on starting something of that sort. Um, I think it may make good YouTube content, but more so I want to get my family away from all the junk in the city and the pollution and just the junk. Just call it the junk. I want to get them away from the junk. So I would be interested in knowing what you're doing if you're really out there doing something. Covenant Homestead said, 
Just came across his channel. Excellent content. Folks are broke out there. I'm a local handyman and business has gotten thin. By the way, guys, something that has in all of these comments, there has been one resounding theme that I think has a very solid basis. Everyone has reminded me that this month is the month that college loan payments start back up. That hiatus everybody had is gone. And a lot of paying hundreds upon hundreds of dollars a month for their college loans. For quite a long time, they haven't been required to pay on them. This is the month. So that money that was disposable to those people a month ago that they may or may not have been hiring you with, that money now has to start getting paid again. They no longer have that disposable income. That is going to cause a significant drop in the amount of requests that you receive. Maybe not significant for everybody, but if you're in a place where there are a lot, a lot, a lot of college graduates and they're relying on their college degree that got them the job that they got, if suddenly they have to start paying that loan again, that may be the difference between all of their income and having some disposable income. So uh, one obvious suggestion that I've made before on a previous video is delve into this property management world because it doesn't rely on any of that. All of our work is not optional. It's work that must get done. And I think you're going to have a little bit of luck here, but you can diversify. It doesn't have to be just property management. I just want y'all to know that's here. But even more so, there are other sources of revenue. You know, there are, I'm not going to try to go through the list, but it's not just college educated people who have a loan to pay that are owning homes and needing people to work on them. There are a lot of other people in that boat. And I think what it's going to take is a lot of brainstorming between you guys on here, you guys in the comments. Alan probably has tons of great ideas. I have some ideas, but I am very stuck in my role with property managers. So I don't think about acquiring clients as often as he does. And that's another way his channel is going to be useful to you. Um, but yeah, so the college loans have to get paid back now. They have to start making payments. And I do think that that may be what resulted in so many handymen so suddenly saying that their workload has dramatically decreased. But I think we're going to be okay. And what I don't want more than anything is I don't want y'all going out there thinking the instant your workload decreases, I don't want you thinking the solution is to drop your prices. That may pay some bills this week, and I'll never fault anyone for doing what they need to do to pay their bills. So that may pay some bills, but in the long run, all that's going to do is gain you more cheap clients rather than help your business succeed in the long term. Where are we at? Where are we at? <clears throat> Uh, Builder Breaker Remaker. Man, I really do like that name a lot. Uh, he said, thank you. The home was a rental previously, and I got the opportunity to see the work of a sloppy handyman and clean up much of it. It reinforced that my work and time spent is above what's acceptable. And yes, I agree. And I think you're going to find that to be the case. Do me a big favor. This is This is a lesson I had to teach myself. I didn't have to learn it the hard way, luckily. But I am not immune to the idea that, so I'm going to give you an example. I walk into any rental, just like the one you just redid. I walk into any rental. I see all the shitty work. I see it everywhere. I see the patches on the wall that stick out from the wall a quarter inch and have no texture on them. And they're, they're just a patch and it's just flat and it's painted over and it looks like junk. And you see all the crappy work all throughout the home. You're going to realize, because this is true, you're going to realize that you can do crappy work too and still charge good money for it. And you're not incorrect. You can go in there. I've seen this play out so many times. A new handyman, meaning new to this property management company, somebody that they've never met can show up and for two to three months impress them and convince them that they're doing good work at good prices. However, Eventually, it starts coming back. The biggest example I always give, because I've seen it more than once, and I don't know if I'm following behind one handyman who always did this or multiple, but I'll go to take a towel bar that's falling off the wall. I'll go to take that towel bar to remount it, and I find that what it's mounted in is expanding foam because somebody in the past was tasked with remounting a towel bar and where the, sh the drywall anchors pulled out of the drywall and bored those holes open they just filled it in with expanding foam and put some screws into it. You can do that and it may not fall off for three months. You can. You can make a lot of money doing the shittiest work and then just disappear three months later. Don't do that. What you want to do is ignore all of that. 
You want to pretend like you're in an industry where you do have serious competition. Pretend that that's the industry you're in and do that level of work. And that doesn't mean luxury work. Some people want to buy a Lexus. Some people will want to buy an old beater for a thousand bucks. And some people want something in between. You need to know your property manager, your property management company. You need to look at the quality of the house itself. Uh, when you get to the point I've gotten to, you start getting to where you know who the owners are of many of these properties and you know how they feel about their properties and what level of quality they're looking for. But do good quality all of the time, please. Hey, Daryl, the finisher's in here. What's up, Daryl? So next, um, oh man, y'all are commenting a lot. This is cool. So Swanny Swanson said, quickly recap what you put in your introduction packet, if you would. Uh, I can do a quick recap, a really quick one. I do have dedicated videos on this, and I don't want to answer this on every live stream, but it's your business license, your city business, state business. If you have any licensing for the work that you're doing, like a contractor's license, HVAC, et cetera, all your licensing goes in there, your insurance goes in there your workman's comp goes in there or your workman's comp waiver. However, I recommend you just pay for workman's comp anyways, even if you could just have a waiver. They do like to see that. It's not very expensive and it makes you look like a professional. Um, all of your insurances, you want to have a, a list of jobs that you can do. And to get that list, you can click on the link in any of my videos. They all have it. There's a link that says for blah, blah, blah and other documents that I have for free do that documents request. I'll send you my list. My list is pages and pages long, single space of literally every job that a property manager is ever going to ask you to do. I'm sure there's a couple missing because I'm not perfect, but I'm telling you, if you use that list, go down that list and every job you can do, put it on your list. If you want to give them your pricing structure, do that. Make sure before you approach them, you know what your pricing structure is going to be because they're going to want to know. And a lot of them aren't going to like your answers if your answers are similar to mine, because we don't do hourly. We don't give anybody hourly rates. I may use the time I spent on a job to help dictate what I ultimately charge, but we don't do hourly rates. But you want to show up with everything involved in your business, as well as the list of what you do and know what your pricing is going to be. Show up looking good, smelling good, shake their hand, look them in the eye, and you'll get some property managers in a day. Let's see. Uh, Handyman Journey said, pride comes before a fall. Yeah, and we're all guilty of it, guys. We just, if you think you're not, then you're like me during the times when I think I'm not. When I am, and I don't realize I am because I've just had a little bit too many things go right for me in the very recent history, and I get cocky, and I do, and I say things that are cocky. It's what we do, you know, and the best we can do is acknowledge when we've done it and move on from there. The handyman journey said pride in itself is a good feeling, but you can't let pride run you. It will quickly take you down. And I couldn't agree more. The covenant homestead homestead said done deal. Yes, sir. Hexa said, I feel like working on rental properties is the future. It's what I focus on mainly. A lot of people will probably be renting in the future, whether they want to or not due to political scenarios. I agree a hundred percent. I've mentioned on some other videos. Um, somebody again, Somebody needed to go into the comments and tell me how I shouldn't say anything about this because I don't know what I'm talking about. And maybe I don't, guys. But what I do know is BlackRock, Vanguard, and what is it, State Street, the other third big one, they're starting to own everything. Now, they're not, there's no like Vanguard writes a check for a house, but these are all big investment agencies that own lots of other agencies, some of which own lots of other agencies. And when you trickle it all down, they've realized what's going on with housing and they are cornering housing. More than half of all properties that are being built right now, new builds, more than half of them are being built solely for rentals, that for the stated purpose of they're just going to be a rental. We're moving to a rental sort of society. I don't agree with people who say they'll never be able to own a home. I don't think that's true. The instant you decide that you'll never be able to do something, that's when it becomes a guarantee you'll never be able to. That's the man in the arena scenario. You can decide that it's not possible and that it's other people's fault and there's nothing you can do about it. And then you can sit fat and happy and watch TV and just complain about how the world didn't let you succeed. Or you can get in the arena 
right now, today. Just get up and get in the arena. And then at least if you're going to say, in fact, let me go back and read this. It's exactly what it says. And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Guys, if there's something you can't do because the world is just set up against you, do yourself a favor. Try as hard as you can to do it. Do everything you can to succeed. And then when you still can't succeed, despite giving it everything, then you can say, I tried as hard as I could. I gave it everything and still couldn't succeed rather than being the guy who said I can't and then just left it there because you can. Everybody can. People do. And they're not better than you and they're not smarter than you. They're not anything more than you are. You can do whatever it is you decide to do. And worst case scenario, go fail at trying rather than just deciding that you can't. Let's see. Da, da, da. Where'd we go? Where'd we go? Here we are. Uh, Hexa said, such as BlackRock foreign investment firms buying all the housing specifically for rentals. Yes, sir. That's what we were talking about. Hey, Rico Reels Fishing is back. Said, saw that you got a shout out from another handyman channel. That's awesome. Yeah, it was from uh, Alan Lee over there with um, the handyman journey. We had a neat conversation this morning. If you rewatch this video after the live is done, you can see where I talk about our conversation. We've actually got uh, a very, very, very similar outlook on the industry and on how to run a business, et cetera. Daryl the Finisher, I said hi earlier. How you doing, Daryl? Uh, listening while I'm working. Love the content. Thank you, sir. I watch actually quite a few of your videos. I I like your attitude. Guys, if you haven't watched Daryl the Finisher, I really like his attitude. I also like the fact that he's just been in this industry so long and he's done enough of it. He knows what he's talking about. I feel like if you guys, especially if you're wanting to do, let's say, and I don't know if Daryl, I don't think he does exclusively wealthy clients or exclusively larger jobs, but I often see him talking about doing slightly larger jobs that require more planning, more investment, more time. Um, I feel like he really knows what he's doing and his advice all sounds super solid to me. So I do suggest listening to him as well or watching him. I always say, listen. Because, you know, if I'm trying to learn how to do a job, I'm watching YouTube. But unless I'm trying to figure out how to do a job I've never done before, I just hit play and put the phone in my pocket and typically have my headphones in. And I'm listening to all of these. But and yeah, see, Daryl's listening. He's not watching. He's listening because he's working. The Covenant Homestead, Homestead said, what I have noticed is that some clients don't know what good work is. Oh, it's absolutely true. Some clients don't know what good work is. A lot of clients don't know what a fair price for that work is. They think $100 an hour, which I'll reiterate, is just the number I throw out as a minimum. You could live in places in the U.S. where 80 or 75 is fair. You could live in places where 250 is fair. Um, it depends on where you live and the cost of living and a thousand other factors. But what I will say is a lot of clients, the Covenant Homestead is correct. They don't know what good work is necessarily, and they also don't know what fair pay is, which is another reason that I preach this being in the arena thing. If you're in the arena and they're not, you don't need to let what they say to you get to you. If they call you greedy, if they say that you're the reason that old ladies can't take their medication this month, it's just not true, guys. It's just not true. It's only not true if it's not true, if that makes any sense. As I, I'm going to repeat this, I have never said, nor will I ever say, that you should simply charge as much as you can. I have always said there is a window. Below that window, you're not being fair to yourself. Above that window, you're not being fair to the client. But that window is a large window, and you can be near the top of the window. I don't suggest trying to be at the top, touching the top all the time. You're, you're going to gain the reputation of being greedy, even if you could have charged more and you chose not to. But somewhere in that upper half, maybe upper third, try to stay in there. And then when people feel that you're a bad person for being where you're at, understand they're not in the arena. They don't know what your taxes are. They don't know what your CRM software costs. They don't know what your accountant costs, your insurance for your business, as well as your commercial liability on your vehicle. They don't know how much value of your vehicle is being degraded on a daily basis by all the miles you put on it. There are a thousand other factors. They don't know your numbers. They're not in the arena. Don't take what they say personally. They're outside of the arena, criticizing the people that are inside the arena. They don't matter. 
any further than it matters that you treat them well and give them a good quality job at a fair price. But outside of that, their personal opinion of you as a person doesn't matter. As long as you are actually being fair with everything. The Handyman Journey said, uh, never lower your rates. Always make sure you are charging enough to pay the bills and make a profit. And that's a good point. And you know, guys, that's something that I think you're going to gain from Alan Lee over at the Handyman Journey is I don't really talk about profit a lot. My business is not as large as his. And that doesn't mean I shouldn't talk about profit and think about profit but I'm still in this phase where just despite being so busy and despite doing so much work, I am not yet in a place where I can really break the number. Like, for example, I don't give myself a regular paycheck and I'm sure Alan does. And I'm sure Alan probably because he's very bus business savvy, probably has from just about the very beginning. He probably started off not doing that, but he probably figured it out quickly. I'm still in the boat where if a bunch of money comes in. I've already got eight things that that money needs to shoot out to. So for me, profit isn't even a thing. But the truth is, is you do need to be making a profit, too, because that's how a business grows. What you should be doing, which I don't do, like I said, go to Alan for some of this information. You should be paying yourself a specific wage, some like a salary that you've decided you're going to pay yourself for running the business. And then you can bonus yourself afterwards if there's enough profit for you to reinvest in the business and to bonus yourself. But if you want to grow, if that's your goal, you need to be considering not only how much money is going into your pocket and what all of your expenses are, but also you do want to have some amount of profit on that. You're not, you are a business without it, but you're more of a legit business when you reach that point where you can start saying, hey, you know what? I'm actually going to set aside this little piece as profit. I'm actually going to start adding this to my, my estimates and my prices because I want my business to profit. That's the only way you can grow is by profiting. So that's some good advice actually that he has that I don't particularly give out because I don't have the experience to really talk about that yet. Next, what do we have? Daryl the Finisher said, where I live, they're building whole developments for lease. Crazy. Yeah, they are. Um, where my sister lives in Texas too. She's in the Midland Odessa Metroplex. And they actually build entire developments just as rentals there. And the truth is they probably are here in Tucson. I just haven't heard about it. Like, I don't know of any specific ones. But that's a thing that's happening now. And all of those need to get worked on. And a lot of people say that those companies are going to go with in-house maintenance. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think what it's going to be is this model that I'm not particularly a fan of. I've mentioned it once or twice on the channel. Uh, usually when I see it, it's borderline illegal, at least in Arizona, although it happens anyways. And what that is, is having an exclusive vendor. So I'm going to tell you all a quick story. When I first got started, I was with uh, not the largest property management company in Tucson, but at the time, I think they were the largest real estate company. And if not the largest, they were number two or three, which is huge for a city the size of Tucson. And they wanted, they offered... I was an independent handyman with my own LLC, and they liked what I was doing so much. This was very, like, two months after starting to work for them. They wanted to bring my LLC in under their umbrella LLC and make me a part of their organization, and I would then be their exclusive vendor. However, the tenants wouldn't know that. The tenants would not know, or rather, let's say the homeowners, the actual clients who were paying the bills in the end. The homeowners wouldn't necessarily know that my company, whose name is not the same as the property management company, that my, they wouldn't know my company had become part of their company. So it would appear to them that we're hiring a third party vendor being my company when in fact I would be under them and they would be able to access some of my profits. I think it's the wrong way to do things, but I do think it's the way that these BlackRock or whatever agencies beneath them that they ultimately end up tasking with running this whole show, I think that's probably what they're going to end up going with. So I'm probably going to have to learn more about that world. Um, however, I will not compromise my ethics. I will not become a part of a company. And like I said, here in Arizona, it's literally illegal. It's illegal in Arizona for the property manager to, uh, to charge any specific extra fee or profit off of their time that they put into coordinating the maintenance. Now they are allowed to just charge the set fee. 
you know, just the overall fee that the homeowner pays. They can charge that, and that's part of the work that they do, but they can't profit specifically off of the handyman. And I won't do that, but we'll see what happens. It's it's a ways down the line. This is going to take years, you know, when you're only affecting two or three percent of a market. It takes years to get to the point where that effect starts really, really showing. And that's where we're at. But just know it's an exponential growth curve. So what is minor today is going to be minor tomorrow. It's going to be minor the next day. But once that curve does get started going up, it goes up fast. So we're going to need to be prepared for that as well. Builder Break Remaker said, I'll be sure to keep my quality above what's expected and something... I and they can be proud of. I can't do the hack jobs and be okay with myself. I actually used your pricing sheet to help invoice. Yeah, and my pricing sheet, I do hope you notice, for that pricing sheet, obviously, I think it's obvious if you look at the prices. Those prices are not what you charge to drive to an address, do a job, and leave. Those prices are the prices that I use for my move-outs because they're based on literally timing myself. And it's outdated, by the way, so you guys need to be timing yours. My pricing sheet is a place for you to start. It's not something for you to use. I don't even use that sheet anymore. I have my, my numbers change every day and I keep them updated in my jobber software because I have all of my main jobs, the most common jobs, like a hundred of them are in there as a preset where I just click on them and do the quantity. But those are based on if I'm already at the property, if I've already charged a trip fee to get there, like say for a move out, those prices are what I charge in addition to that. And those are really minimums. I will oftentimes charge more than the prices on that price sheet. But I am glad it came in handy. I'm I'm really happy to hear anytime you all requested my documents and found them useful. I just apologize that they're not the most professional documents in the world. I, I didn't I didn't develop a business idea to start a YouTube channel and set everything up in advance to give you some sort of product for money. What I did was I started the channel. I had document, I had lists and things. And when I realized they could be useful without having the time to go upgrade them and make them super professional, I just try to make them available to you and hope that you'll figure out the right way to use them. All right, Daryl, the finisher said, I have a few rich clients, but most of my work is done for middle class families. That's probably nice. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like a lot of rich people. I've met a lot of rich people who uh, they really earned what they have. And those are some of the coolest dudes around. Um, and then, you know, the ones who didn't earn it, I'm not such a fan of. But the middle class is it's where I come. Well, I come from lower class, but at best, it's where I come from and it's where I've spent all of my life. Hexa said they are just upset that they're in the gutter and that you refuse to sit there with them. I know my self-worth and have self-respect after years of being taken advantage of. Yeah, that's good. And I actually know what you mean, sir. Sometimes we need to get, sometimes we start off life as nice guys. I definitely did. We start off as nice guys, as non-confrontational nice guys. And oftentimes what ends up happening is you're nice for a decade or how, however long you were dumb enough to just keep being a nice guy for you were nice, you were nice, you were nice. People take advantage of it. And there does, there just comes a day someday in your life when you finally can't do that anymore. It's not even that you chew for me. I never chose to stop being a nice guy. What I did was I just finally couldn't do it anymore. And that didn't mean I became an asshole. It just means I stopped. When I say nice guy, a nice guy is somebody who's non-confrontational, whose goal is to get everybody to like them. You want to agree with everybody. You're very agreeable with everything everybody says. You'll even tell, you know, you'll agree with these friends when they say this, and then you'll agree with that group when these guys aren't around, if they say something different. You're just always trying to make people happy. And the day you figure out that you don't need to do that, the day you figure out that life is short, and we're all going to die, and you have X amount of time left on this planet, and you want it to be happy time that you spend doing productive things that are good for you, your family, and your community. When you figure that, when you figure out that that's the goal, it starts becoming easy not to be mean, but just simply to stop being a nice guy and to just start being the guy who's taking care of business. And if people, for me, if people add value to my life, I bring them in and I keep them and I'm as loyal as the day is long. But if they don't add value to my life, or very specifically, if they pull value from my life, 
with no intent. And I don't, I'm not talking about like if one of my friends became homeless and broke his back and had to move in for three months to get on his feet, that's not taking value from my life. That's me being a good friend to a friend. But if somebody doesn't add value by being in your life in a general overall sense, don't have them in your life. If a client doesn't add value to your business, if they're not a good client, don't have them in your business. I don't know how I get off on these tangents. So Y'all don't seem to mind. Well, except my viewers dropped by like 10 people. So some people seem to mind. Let's see. Builder Break, a remaker, said thank you for providing that. I knocked a large amount off because it's family. Honestly, felt bad even charging what I did. But we understand that they got a deal and great work on top, and I feel good. And that's the important thing. Uh, my policy with family is I won't do work for family for money. So I do one of two things. I either, if they need it done and they need it done soon, then what I do is I say, look, I will work for you for free because you're family. Literally, because you're family. I don't want my family paying me. However, I'm in a different position. And this is nothing builder, breaker, remaker. This is not about you, sir. I think you've probably done an amazing job here. Where I've been able to get to recently is I can say, hey, I'm going to do what you need if it's a small job that I can make the time for because my property managers have to get taken care of. I say, hey, here's here's the deal. I don't want to charge you money. I don't want you to pay me. I understand that you're probably going to anyways because you want to feel that you've supported me the same way I want to support you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what I would charge a property manager. I'm also going to tell you to please don't pay me that much. I don't want that much. But you pick a price between zero and 125 and you pay me whatever you feel like. And I'm not going to count it. I'm going to stick it in my pocket. And when I get home, I'm going to give it to my wife and tell her to spend it on the babies. I feel really good doing that. I do have a family member who wants a new kitchen. I definitely can't do that. Like I, well, no, it's not that I can't. I definitely can't afford to take a week off of the business to build a new kitchen for free or to build a new kitchen for whatever he wants to pay. But what I am going to do is I'm going to figure out what the bare minimum is that I must make sort of to get by. And I'm going to take a hit on my business's income that week as far as let's let's say profit, right, which I don't put enough thought and energy into. But I'm going to take a hit on my business's income that particular week to help him out. But that's OK because it is family. And guys, he's been there for me in ways that you can't imagine. We lost a vehicle driving back from Texas. We had a fuel pump go out in our Dodge Grand Caravan, uh, like three hours from my hometown, just on our way to Tucson, got towed back and everything, ended up renting a vehicle, driving back to Tucson. But I had a handyman business to run and we had these little baby, I mean, baby, baby, baby twins. They were born in June. This happened at Christmas. So they were less than a year old. And this man, Without hesitating, the instant he found out we didn't have a vehicle and we were trying to figure out a way to have a vehicle, as soon as we got back to Tucson, he literally gave us his truck, a truck that he uses on a daily basis. He had another crappier vehicle that he could drive back and forth to work, and he just gave us his truck for months until we could get something to replace that minivan. So I'm going to return the favor with the kitchen. Uh, Try Merc Remodeling Repair said, struggling with paint... With painting prices per square foot, listen to the management at Sherwin-Williams and truly think I angered a client. Oh, did they tell you? Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing, guys. I remember I'm not on Facebook anymore. I used to be on Facebook and I was part of some handyman groups. I just got rid of Facebook altogether for like ethical reasons. I don't like them. I don't think they're good for the world. But a lot of these guys on this Facebook page are absolutely preaching and absolutely certain that the price is minimum a dollar a square foot. And they're not talking about the square feet of the house. They're talking about the square feet of paintable surface. So the actual square foot of footage of every wall. Now, there are absolutely places in this country where you can get that. There are absolutely clients right here in Tucson, specific clients who will pay that. However, when you're in this business, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you want to be careful listening to a bunch of guys on places like Facebook or to the people at Sherwin or at a, where was it? Sherwin Williams. Yeah. They probably told them a dollar a square foot or something silly like that. And then the clients got angry at the price and who knows, maybe it wasn't silly. I can't say for sure if that pricing was in line. I can tell you I'm at 
the last time I did the math backwards to figure out what I had ultimately charged, the last time I did a full interior paint, I was probably around $3 a square foot based on the square footage of the house, not on the square footage of the paintable surface. Um, but it's, it's you got to figure out your market, and that's the main thing is you really do. What I can tell you is everywhere I go, property managers typically have a guy who's a dollar a square foot guy, <clears throat> and he's a dollar a square foot based on the square footage of the house. He waters down the paint. I know he does because I use his paint to do touch-ups when he leaves the paint behind, and it's always watered down. These guys water down the paint. They do a dollar a square foot. They make a mess of the doorknobs. They, they don't remove doorknobs. They don't remove switch plates. They don't remove fixtures. They don't remove towel bars. It's usually a mess. They're a dollar a square foot. You're going to have a hard time competing with them. So what I do is I don't try to compete with them. I let my property managers know up front, hey, um, painting isn't what I do. That, that's not my specialty. Therefore, I'm less efficient. However, I think I have quality. I have a higher quality. So I just let them know right off the bat. If you ask me for a paint estimate, please understand I'm not trying to screw you. That's just the price that I'm going to have to get for the type of work that I do. And I do think that you can find a cheaper painter. However, if you've got a house that's super expensive, super important, must get done on time by somebody who keeps their word to a high level of quality. My interior paint jobs are actually one of the things that I do the highest level of quality on. I'm very proud of them, um, but it is more expensive. And the prices across the country are absolutely, they vary so widely, you can't put an average on it or put a rule to it. Hexa, uh, oh, uh, so Merck Remodeling Repair told Hexa, they told him 250 to $3 per square foot. That includes material. Yeah, that's close to where I'm at, actually, when it's all said and done. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, based on the square footage of the house, not of the square footage of the walls, uh, that is a high price for most of the people that I talk to here, as well as local painters who do very well. My pricing is very much in line with theirs. They're probably a little bit higher than me, but I'm talking about like 10% higher than me, not 50% higher than me. Hexa said also depends on the cost of living and type of property. If it's a rental, that's one thing. If it's a fancy pad, then that has to be accounted for. Yeah, that's a big, big, big thing in the property management world. If you're going to work here, you need to take into account the property you're on. If you're on a slum on the south side, the quality that you need to put into that, which is directly tied to the price you're going to charge. If it's a cheap, crappy property, the owner's expecting cheap prices. And it doesn't mean you need to do cheap work, but what it does mean is from zero to 100, 80 being just a good, satisfactory job, 100 being nobody has a clue it's even been repaired because it's as good as new and you can't tell anything was ever wrong. Between that 80 and 100, you want to always hit the 80. But for the slum on the south side, you give them the 80. For the spec home that's in the nicer area of town, but it's still just a spec home, give them 87%. For the mansion on the north side that costs $4 million, has eight bedrooms and four baths, and a giant jacuzzi pool that's bigger than any jacuzzi pool you've ever seen in your life, give that one 100% and charge appropriately. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Hexa said also depends on if it's a whole house or just a room. Price cut on more extended work. Exactly, yeah. It costs more to go paint a room than it costs to paint an entire house because that the, the prep is oftentimes very much the same, uh, if at least similar. So it is going to cost more to do a room than a whole house. Hexa said if it's a smaller job, I usually make better margins, get hammered on larger jobs. I'm a solo operation. Yeah, that's mostly true there. And being a solo operation... Uh, it, I don't know about y'all. It takes me about four days to do a full interior paint. If I'm doing full, full interior paint, including ceilings and everything, that's usually four full days of work for me. However, I make really good money when I do full interior paint. Builder Breaker Remaker said, I understand. I've seen enough of your content to know what your stance is on family. I see it the same way. I also clearance shop and got them ridiculous deals on the materials new new custom door even that's really nice of you i appreciate that and they appreciate that i'm sure um 
a lot of property managers are going to want you to do something similar. And of course, you can't really do that for them because that's billable time. When you're doing it for family, of course, you can put in that extra time because it's family. You know, that's all there is to it. It's family. So I don't I don't worry about numbers when it comes to family, but that's good. You got them the deals. Rico Reels Fishing said, I'm just starting out and have only worked for a handful of people. So far, I haven't had anyone complain about my prices, but something tells me the estimate I sent today will be my first no, my first no, LOL. Uh, you'd be surprised. Do let me know. I want to know uh, what the estimate was, uh, like how much it was for and what the job was. I'd be curious, and I'd especially be curious to know if they said yes or not. Because one of the ways that experienced handymen end up finding out what their value is, is there's someday there's going to come a time when you need to submit an estimate to somebody for a job you really don't want. And I don't recommend putting stupid prices on there. But sometimes when it's a job you really don't want, you bump that estimate up a little bit because you're like, eh, I kind of hope they go with somebody else. You're not trying to be unethical, but you're putting it at the top of that window because you really would prefer they go with somebody else. You'd be surprised how often they say yes over and over. It's like my interior paint. They have a dollar a square foot guy. I'm, like I said, somewhere probably between 250 and three bucks a square foot. I have charged more for big vaulted ceilings and for lots, lots of other complexities. But generally speaking, for just your regular old spec home, you know, on the edge town, uh, 250 to three dollars a square foot, including the price of the paint. Um, that's expensive compared to the dollar a square foot guy. It's literally three times as expensive. And they still, I just submitted an estimate the other day and they know what my prices are. They know I'm more expensive. And sometimes they just really want somebody they can rely on because that paint, let's say that you don't meet the deadline and this house doesn't get rented for another month. Somebody's paying a mortgage on that house. It's over a thousand dollars a month, you know, could be two, you never know, but somebody's paying a mortgage on that house. And if they have to pay another mortgage without a tenant living there, your lack of finishing it on time costs them an extra thousand dollars on top of all sorts of other expenses that get bumped up. So it is if you can be the reliable guy, they do appreciate that and they will pay a premium for that. And to me, that's not ripping anybody off. That's not price gouging. That's not any of the things that I'm frequently accused of. What that is, is just them acknowledging your that your rates are fair and that you're solid and that the value you bring is worth the money you're charging. And moreover, the way you really know that is that they're happy to keep sending you that work at that rate. If there was somebody else with your skill level, your reliability, your business acumen that they felt as comfortable with, if there was somebody else, they would be using them. And my clients have been with me two to three years now. My biggest clients have been more than two years for all of them. And they're happy to keep sending me the work. They're happy with my prices. They almost never complain, which is a bad sign, because if they never complain, it might mean that everyone else's prices are going up and mine's still down here, which is why I play with them over time. But the point is, uh, if it, you need to provide the value. Your value as a handyman is not based on the work you perform. It's based on the overall value that your business brings to their business. Builder Breaker Remaker said, because I got clearance shopped for over a decade and got the majority of my tools this way, I know that Lowe's and Home Depot clearance out really anything for a home and negotiate sometimes. They do. And man, some of their clearance items, like when I'm in Home Depot, which is every day, when I walk past those end caps with the clearance items, I stop at every one of them. I don't stay for very long, but I just skim every one of them, because there's a lot of things that cost a lot of money that you'll be surprised how steeply they're discounted. And if you're trying to build an inventory like I always am, that's when you grab those, things, you put them in your inventory. Uh, Merc Remodeling Repair said, they said one coat of the same color was a dollar, but $2.50 to $3 with material. So they're saying that the labor to recoat with one color should be a dollar, but simply adding material to it should cost two fifty to three. Because I wouldn't agree with them on that. I, the materials cost, honestly, is super insignificant on any paint job I do. The materials, a five-gallon bucket of a decent quality paint, depending on where you go, depending on the sheen, depending on a lot of things. But let's say 
that we can ballpark the price of a five gallon bucket of paint at 150 bucks. Even though I know you can get them for 100 and I know there's better stuff at 200, call it 150 bucks. Three gallon, three of those five gallon buckets, without a doubt, if it's not a mansion, three five gallon buckets is going to do the whole house. So you're really talking about, I think when I do, when I estimate materials on an interior, a full interior paint, on a nice, a good size, say 2,000 square foot house. When I'm estimating materials for that, I can almost just call it 600 and not really do any math. I don't really need to look up the paint and I don't need to look up the materials. I can just, from experience, I've done enough of them. I know that I almost never spend more than 600, even though the jobs obviously are far over that. <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. Uh, Roman said, paint sprayer thoughts. I'm, I'm going to, you know what? I've never done a video on this and maybe I should. I'm going to start this off by saying I'm not the guy to ask. I have what I feel like is a lot of experience doing full interior paint, but I have nowhere near the experience of a professional full interior painter. What I can tell you based on my experience and also based on dozens of YouTubers, and I mean dozens of YouTubers who are full-time they own a company that does nothing but paint for people, and they're successful. Here's what I've found. Uh, number one, the smaller it is, the less useful spraying it. So if it's a if it's a if it's an 800 square foot place, you're never going to come out ahead spraying. You're always going to come out ahead rolling and painting by hand. That does assume, however, that you've reached the level I've reached where I don't need to put tarps down and I don't need to tape almost anything ever. You can get good enough to cut all of your corners perfectly by hand. You can get good enough to have literally no drops hit the floor. Or let's say three drops hit the floor, but you know you need to have a wet rag nearby and a little bottle of water. And when a drop does hit the floor, you know right away you take that rag, wipe it up, and you're good to go. If it's on the carpet, you wipe it up, and then you squirt some water on it. And you do that a couple times, maybe get one more rag, and it's, it literally leaves no mess. But yeah, so if it's small, painting with a sprayer is not worth it. If you're doing uh, an entire apartment complex, you're almost certainly going to spray. So number one is the size of the job. The bigger the job, the better it is to spray. Number two, what I've found out is that for single-family residential homes between 1,500 and 2,500 square feet, if we can ballpark an average there. Um, what I've found is equally successful painters are on both sides of the fence. And when they talk about their numbers, when they talk about the man hours that go in, specifically how long these jobs take and what it takes for them to get it done, including cost of materials and everything else, including time in terms of not man hours that you add up because you might have three guys on the job at the same time. So that's three man hours per hour, but also time in terms of the number of days that building is unavailable for people to live in because you're painting. What I found is that it seems like the best, the ones who have put a decade into it and really know what they're doing. There are sprayers and there are rollers. They both get them done in about the same amount of time. They both get them done at about the same profit margin. So I think for you, as an individual who needs to submit an estimate and figure out how they're going to do it. I personally, what I like to do is I like to do all my cutting by hand, the whole house. Uh, let me go through my process. We'll do this. Y'all didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Day one at a full interior paint, day one is removing everything, removing hinges from doors, removing doorknobs, removing light fixtures, removing wall plates, removing everything that I'm going to remove because I want to do a professional paint job. For example, the ceiling fan, big round thing that sticks up on the ceiling that, that touches the ceiling, I pop that down so I can paint underneath it, because someday they may want to replace that with another fixture, and I don't want them to have to go try to buy matching paint for my one little circle. I try to be, to me, it's professional to go ahead and paint behind all of that. So day one, remove everything, tape the few things that I'm going to tape, set up an area that's to make a mess in where I have a nice big tarp on the ground that's folded into fours and it's still big so that no paint can seep through that tarp. And that's my work. That's my staging area. And then I start my cutting in. Cutting in, for those who don't know, let's say you have a white wall and a red wall. 
cutting is when you're painting that line. When you're making that line between the wall and ceiling, the wall and the corner, the baseboard, the fixtures, anywhere that you need to have a line of paint that ends, that first day I start my cutting. Day two is a whole day of cutting. All damn day on any house I do, it's a day of cutting in bathrooms, kitchens, closets, everywhere. Day three, the entire day, I may finish a little cutting that morning if it was a lot of cutting, but usually day three is I use a Wagner Power Roller. It's the, it's the roller that has the tube that goes all the way back to the bucket of paint, and you will roll an entire house in a day. Easily, I promise you, if you get good at using that thing, you will roll every ceiling, every wall, inside every closet, bathroom, kitchen, laundry room, everywhere. You roll the whole house on day three. And then day four is just clean up and putting everything back together and finding whatever little touch-ups you might have missed. That's my process for a full interior paint. And then if it's vaulted ceilings, if it's a 3,000 square foot house, or if it has three bathrooms or four bathrooms, uh, bathrooms take a lot of time to do all the cutting and stuff, then, uh, you know, it, it adds an additional day. But that's how I do it. Let's see. Uh, try Merc remodeling repair. Oh, he's probably gone. He was saying, got to go, guys. So if you're still in here, goodbye, sir. It was good to have you. I never see y'all when you leave because I talk too much and I take a while to really give my thoughts on these comments and I try to hit every comment. So I don't see these until you're already gone, but I'm glad you were here, sir. Hexa said, I'll add for anyone who's curious to play with the prices because you need to find your market cap. Some clients will literally complain about your prices, even if they're the lowest in town. Good point, sir. I've never brought that up on this channel, maybe in passing, but I've never truly talked about it. This is very important. Some clients will literally complain about your prices no matter what they are. So if you quoted them $200 an hour, they'll complain. If you quoted them $50 an hour, they'll complain. It doesn't matter what you quote. There are clients whose only goal in life is they want a deal. They just, they want a deal. They want to feel like they got a deal and they can't feel that way unless they talk you down. So keep that in mind. Uh, Hexa also said, whatever the market can bear is what it's going to bear. And you have to be where the money is to be made. Maybe harder in the countryside compared to the burbs. Yes, absolutely. That's true. If you're in a rural area or if you're in a, even if it's a larger city, but in a sort of a rural state, a more blue collar state, there are going to be more men who know how to do things. And that's ultimately going to result in those men are doing those things instead of you for, for free or for less. Um, so yeah, where you are depends is going to highly affect where your rate should be, which is why I try not to tell people what to charge. And I tell people only use my pricing list as a starting point. You got to figure out your own. The only thing I really preach is if you're a hundred dollars, if you're under a hundred an hour, you need to have a super good reason for it. Because if you're a legit business paying for all these expenses, including an accountant, CRM software, all the insurances, licensing, bonding, workman's comp, we should write a song about it. If you're under a hundred an hour, you're probably screwing yourself out of some money because you just don't know, because you've never truly sat down and figured out for every hour you spend on the job, what does all that overhead add up to? Because I think what you're going to find is it adds up to far more than you ever thought it would. Rico Reels Fishing said, I felt it was fair. 645 to stain two separate decks, different colors, roughly 6 by 8 and 10 by 10. Fix a sagging gate, fix an awning, remove a fire pit and a hardened concrete bag, and fix a recliner. I'll tell you what, if all of that... If somebody, if a property manager asked me for an estimate, a flat fee, including materials estimate for all of that, and of course I haven't seen the job, but I would absolutely be, let's say not including materials, so only my labor. I don't know what the repair on the awning was. Removing a fire pit, if it's an above ground like metal one, I guess that's easy. You just throw that in the trash. But if it's like a brick one that you need to remove in the ground, that's different. I'm going to say the minimum in labor I would ever charge for this job is about what you estimated. Like, because to me, I would look at this and I would say, okay, if everything goes right, 
this is a six hour job. If everything goes wrong, this is a two day job. And I would be looking at this and I would probably be, I, I think I would probably estimate eight or $900 in labor. And that would be for a property manager that I like, whom I'm not trying to make feel like I'm gouging them because, you know, a lot of a lot of our profits come from when we charge a hundred and twenty five dollar trip fee and they send us to an address where there is a five minute job to do that hundred and twenty five dollar trip fee for that five minute job. In my opinion, that rolls into some of these other jobs where if I know like let's say I know that the homeowner of that the person who owns the rental, not the renter, but the owner, if I know that owner doesn't have a lot of money, it's not a super expensive rental. I know that they tend to take good care of their tenants and want to get their property maintained well, like they're not slumlords, but they also don't have a lot of money to spend on repairs and they treat their tenant good and they treat the property management company good. And they always approve my estimates because they are fair estimates. And I want to maintain a very solid long-term relationship with both the property manager and the homeowner. And that scenario, I would probably be asking for $650 labor with maybe some sort of caveat that says, this is the lowest I can go. By the way, if anything comes up, I may request an additional like cap it and say, I need an additional approval for 150 extra that I may or may not use just in case a couple things that I can't see ahead of time go wrong. But yeah, I feel that that's, I feel that is fair. And of course it all depends on you and your skill level and your, your area. I can only talk about mine, but you have definitely not, um, screwed anybody over or gouged anybody by asking for $645 to do that job. And I'll bet that probably includes the stain. So you're going to go spend another hundred dollars minimum on stain plus a few screws and stuff. Handyman journey said great live video, bro. I'm out. Look forward to talking with you more. You too, sir. I'm sure you're already out of here because y'all always are by the time I see you, but do know that I read these when you tell me that you're leaving and I'm always sad to see you go. And I'm always happy that you came. Hexa said, sounds very fair. Hexa Construction said, later. Goodbye to you too, sir. We got 33 people in here. I'm surprised. Um, we're at hour and 16 minutes. This has been a nice conversation today. Honestly, it has. Roman said, thank you for the hints on not tarping the floors, but wiping the spots on the go. This is only if you're good. <laughs> let, me, let me be really clear about something. I didn't tell you not to tarp the floor. Someday, you're going to drop a paint pail on a carpet, and it's going to be too much paint to get out of that carpet, and you're going to be on the hook for buying new carpet, right? I know that's going to happen because although it hasn't happened to me, I know it's going to happen. It's going to happen to me. If I keep painting over the years, it's going to happen. What I've done is I've literally looked at how much time do I spend putting these tarps down and how much do I, time do I spend pulling them back up. All of that prep work that I have to then unprep at the end, I literally did my numbers and said, okay, I'm spending like six hours per home minimum taping and tarping and taping and tarping and taping and tarping. And then I still got to pull it all up and I got to store it somewhere. Well, I value my time at a minimum of $100 an hour. So we're talking about $600 worth of my value that goes into taping and tarping and being super careful and a lot of that goes into that. And what I figured out was the extra time I spend being careful not to spill anything and to learn how to paint with the right consistency of paint and at the right speed so that I don't get drops flying. In the end, what I figured out was if once every 10 years I have to put new carpet in a room out of my own pocket, it's worth it. I'm saving more during the decade that's going to lead up to that carpet replacement far more than what that carpet replacement's gonna take me. But don't blame me when you ruin a carpet, because I promise you will, I promise I will, it's gonna happen. But for me, the numbers work out to say that I'm in a better place if I just go ahead and paint slightly more slowly and slightly more carefully, and just am prepared to clean up the drops when they do drop, and am financially prepared to replace some carpet if I have to. Let's see. Paul Dardo said, hi, Ray, just finding your live stream. What's going on, Paul, man? I don't, I haven't seen you in one of these 
Is it ever or just in a while? I feel like it's been a long while if you've been in them at all, but I'm glad you're here, sir. Uh, Paul Dardo is, is kill he's in the arena. In fact, Paul, since you're in here, I hope all y'all don't suddenly leave because I'm going to read this again, but I'm going to read the speech again, okay? Because this is super important. I want you to really listen to the words and think about them. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. And Paul, you're in the arena. Who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Guys, Paul is in the arena. I know Paul's in the arena because Paul emails me uh, for a little while frequently because he was really getting in, and now he's doing it. Now he's just doing it, and I don't get as many emails because he's figured out most of the stuff probably he needs to figure out, but Paul's in the arena, and Paul, the what this entire live stream has been about, or what it started for, and what I keep trying to bring it back to, it's a live stream, and we have fun. Uh, but the idea here being, Paul, you're in a position, as is everyone else on this channel who's in the arena, you're in a position where you're trying to do something difficult and new, something different, something above and beyond. And I don't need you to tell me who your haters are, because I'm sure you have them, and I'm sure you know who they are. There's going to be people who are telling you that you're price gouging them. There's going to be people telling you that a handyman isn't a real career. There's going to be haters all the time, all the, all the, all the, all the, all the time, always haters. The thing for you to remember, Paul, is that those haters are not in the arena, are they? They're just not. They don't know what your business expenses are. They don't know what your business model is. They don't know what kind of work you do. They don't know what kind of professionalism you do or don't exhibit. They don't know what value you bring to your clients. They don't know because they are not in the arena and you are, Paul, and everybody in here. You are all in the arena and your naysayers are not. The trick is to understand that in the moment when you get upset, when you feel attacked, in that very moment, Remind yourself, look at them and just go, they're not in the arena. They don't understand. I'm in the arena. I will pay the price for my mistakes if, in fact, I'm making them. They won't be paying the price. Uh, I'm the one with everything at risk here, so I'm the guy in the arena. And I'm going to go back to this. I'm not going to read the whole thing again, uh, but I do want to go back over is <clears throat> who strives valiantly who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. Super important. This is not the only time in this short little paragraph that this is mentioned. The assumption is not that by being in the the assumption is not that by being in the arena, we are stronger, smarter, taller, better looking, faster, or in any way, shape, or form superior to anybody. To be in the arena is just to be in the arena. And if you're not in the arena and you would like to be, the great news about being in the arena, if you want to be the man that's in this paragraph, if you want to be this man, the one who can look at everybody else and say, I'm the one in the fucking arena, if you want to be that man, the great thing is all you have to do is step in. All you have to do is figure out what is the goal, what do I need to do to achieve that goal, and the instant you understand what the next step is, the moment you start taking that step, you've entered the arena. You just step into the arena. That's how you become the man in the arena. And I cannot stress that enough. All right. As usual, man, this has been a great live stream. I really love you guys. As usual, we're almost an hour and a half in and the comments have finally started slowing down. So I'm going to do as I always do at the end of each of my videos and give you all the opportunity to ask any last questions you have, make any last comments you have. And while you're thinking and typing and everything, I'm going to go back over uh, in the description of this video. If you all want to support me, you can uh, go get a free trial of Jobber. I'm not asking you to buy it. And by the way, I've never mentioned this. I realized I should. 
if you get a free trial of Jobber, this is not one of those things where you sign up for a 14 day free trial and then you forget to cancel it and now they charge you. Jobber doesn't do that. You sign up for the free trial and you get some reminders after day 10. But if you reach day 14 and you haven't chosen to purchase Jobber, they don't charge you. You just don't have Jobber until you go ahead and purchase Jobber. Uh, but I love them to death. They were immensely useful in getting this channel up and going because they came along to support me and sponsor me before I ever was big enough for them to do that. Like they really took a leap of faith on me because they saw that I was already promoting Jobber when they hadn't reached out to me and when they weren't supporting me because I, I just believed it was the right software. So it helps me out immensely if you guys interact with Jobber. And I, I think you'll purchase it because I think you'll just find that it's the best software. Um, but I do want to make sure that they know that in thanks for their support, I truly am out here singing their praises. And if you feel like going back far enough, you can go back to before I had a deal with them and see that I loved them before they ever were necessarily on my team. They're just great software. Paul said, how's the masterclass efforts going for you? You probably already mentioned early. Actually, no, Paul, I haven't really. I think I mentioned that I'm going to be doing it. But in terms of how it's going, what I have so far is, so I'm trying to divide this into steps, right? I want it to be very clear, concise steps where you can watch the video, take the steps, and then watch the next video. Not that you can't binge watch, but that if you just watch one at a time and you do what it says one at a time, by the time you get to the last step, you, you're you running a handyman business. You're already there when you take that last step. Um, where I'm at is... I think I've gotten all of the steps laid out, and now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to go back through all of my old content, and I'm trying to really explore everyone else's content as far as handymen, because I want to make sure that before I start the master class, that I've hit everything I need to hit in sort of this format, not just live stream, but in this format. Because once I start the master class, I want that to... I want to have covered everything that I need to cover and have received feedback because I pay attention to y'all's feedback. A lot of there, there are probably people in here, not even probably, most certainly some of you in here have more experience being a handyman than I do, or you have more experience running a business than I do. Um, I, I don't have all the answers. If I did, I would be making a lot, I'd be way more successful if I had all the answers. So I know I don't. So I want to get the last few videos made I need to make, receive all the feedback, then I can compare that to my list. My list is just about finalized. Once it is finalized, then it's going to be a matter of actually planning out the videos like in a very detailed way. So then I'm going to take step one and I'm going to actually map it out on paper. You know, Most of the time I come in here and I have like three or four main points in my head that I know I want to get around to, but I mostly wing it. I mostly just, I sort of speak based on what I believe to be true, and I let it come out naturally. When I do the master class, there's not going to be room for that because I don't want y'all to have to watch a hundred hours worth of videos to get through the master class. So I'm going to be planning it out step by step so that I can make sure I'm giving you all the information you need and none of the information you don't. My handyman business affects how much time I can put into that. So I'm guessing... It seems like on average, I can give it 45 minutes a day. And what that really means is like three hours one day, no time for two more days, one hour the next day. It depends on how much time I have each day. We are heading into the holidays right now. So a lot of my time is going to be taken up by that. But I, if I have to guess, I think I should have the whole package prepared. Oh, and by the way, I'm putting together documents for it too. I'm trying to put together call it a workbook or a packet or something. I want something for y'all to download and print that you can go through the class on paper with me and like, you know, have a block to write down uh, your EIN from the Social Security Administration, a block to write down your policy number for your insurance, a block, blocks to check things off. I want to have a package made. That's probably going to take a week to put together. So I want to say it's going to be ready in a month, but with the holidays and everything coming, Perhaps it'll be a couple months, um, but it's coming along really, really well. And I'm finding more time for these live streams, which is amazing because I get more feedback with the live streams. And then um, Alan Lee, 
uh, from the handyman journey. I'm really, I'm, I'm going to hold on. What do we got here? Oh, I got a property manager calling. Let's see what this is. This is Ray. Hey, Bree, how you doing? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. I am not. Um, just so you know, replacing that coil is not a job that I would be able to do at all. But even as far as just getting the garage door open, even if that's all you wanted, unfortunately, today, um, I made an admin day. And those are the days that my wife plans all of her errands. So I'm stuck home with my two-year-olds, which you can probably hear screaming down the hallway. Um and she's not going to be home literally until like one o'clock in the morning. So I'm, I'm unable okay. to leave the house. I do apologize. That's okay. Don't worry. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You have a great day. Bye. Yeah, I can't leave the house today. I try to say yes. By the way, this is a good example of one of my rules, which is always answer your phone. If a property manager's calling you, I didn't want to answer. I wanted to let it go. Because most of the time, if they're calling, it's not for a good reason anyways. Um, always answer your phone. Always. Even if what you're doing is answering the phone to tell them no, answer your phone. If you don't answer your phone, they view you as somebody who tries to avoid them. Especially if it's a 1 o'clock in the morning call. Answer that one especially. Um, so that's where the class is at. Uh, I'd like to say I'm going to start it in a month. I want to say I'm going to start it in a month, but I'm a little bit like Elon Musk where I, I do Elon time. I think, ah, I'm going to do this and this and this and this, and I'm going to find the time and I'm going to work harder. I'm going to sleep less and I'm going to make this happen in a month when the truth is probably going to be more like two months, but we'll see. I am working as hard as I can on it though. Let's see here where are we at. Hexa said, I'm I'm out to get some Mexican food. Thanks for all the advice and help. You helped me in the beginning of my journey. Much appreciated. Blessing to you and your family. Thank you, Hexa. I hope you're enjoying that Mexican food already. That's my favorite food. Builder Breaker Remaker said, ooh, live call. This is good content. Yeah, I thought about putting her on speaker. I don't know what the ethics are for that. I think I did do that once. I had a proper, yeah, I did definitely had a property manager on speaker. Nobody said anything. I don't feel like I did anything wrong, but afterwards I just thought, you know, here in Arizona, it is legal. We're what's called a one-party consent state. So as long as one of the two parties knows they're being recorded, you can record a phone call legally here. But at the same time, I just, I feel like, uh, you could probably get a lot from just listening to my end, and I don't want to do that without anybody's consent. And I really don't want to point my property managers to my channel. You know, um, I don't say anything to y'all that I wouldn't say to them for the most part. But, you know, sometimes I'm on here just venting about shitty circumstances that I've had with a property manager. They know my pricing. It's what I tell you already. But I don't want them coming in and hearing me like, being a dude with my other dudes, if you know what I mean. Dustin Thompson said, if you talk to your friend, let me know if he needs some work. I have not talked to him. Hold on, let me write that down. I do apologize. Being busy is not a good reason to not follow through with your word. Um, so it is not an excuse. It is just simply the reason as I was very busy and I did overlook calling him. So... All right, I have you on my, like my, I don't know what you call it. It's not really a to-do list. I always have a piece of paper up here that I keep a floating to-do list on, just all the things I need to not forget. And, uh, you know, once it gets full, I just grab a new one and transfer all these over and keep it running. So you're, you're written down on my list. I apologize that I have not talked to him yet. Yeah, Dustin, uh, you're just looking for reliability. So the reason that I wanted him to work for me, I wanted him, I didn't know he had moved to Phoenix at the time, and I was hoping he'd work for me because he was interested. Um, the thing with him when we were in aviation together, this man has ethics. He has a work ethic specifically. He's the guy at Bombardier. 
far more than me. Let me tell you all something. I have work ethic for what I do now, but I did not have work ethic for working for Bombardier, uh, at least not beyond what I thought was, let's say, the minimum that I needed. It was the type of job where, honestly, you could do your job or not do your job, and nobody had to know. Uh, but this guy, Jorge, Jorge shows up every day, every day, early every day. Jorge's the guy that shows up 15 minutes early, but doesn't clock in until we're allowed to clock in. Whereas I was the guy that showed up a half hour early, clocked in and started getting the turnover. And then when the supervisors are upset that people are clocking in before their official clock in time, I'm just like, eh kind of no consequences and uh i wanted to get to work i mean yeah i wasn't a good employee guys i'm i'm not a good employee because i don't like making money for other people i don't like understanding business in a general sense and knowing how much money they're making off of me but i also understand that the reason they're making money off of me is because i went to them and asked them for permission to let them make money off me so i got out of that because i want to do for myself. But yeah, I got, the truth is I'm not get me an hourly job working on somebody else's dream. I'm not a quiet quitter. I work. Oh, don't get me wrong. Let me do say that. I earn my keep. They make money off me because I'm good at whatever I do. I don't do things that I'm not good at. And if I'm not good at it, I'm going to get good at, it, good at it very quickly because that's just my personality type. But yeah, I'm not the kind of, I'm not a perfect employee. Jorge is reliable. Jorge shows up on time every time, every day, works all day. He doesn't start his break early. He doesn't come back from break late. Uh, he doesn't start any problems with people. He's a professional who wants to have a good life for himself. And that's why I wanted to hire him. I can promise you, and I don't go around recommending people to people, but if Jorge is willing to do some work with you or for you, I can tell you this man has a work ethic. He has real ethics. He is who he is. He's principled and he's not going to, he's not going to be the type of handyman that lets you down. Patrick Trotter said, had a meeting with a real estate agent. I thought my pricing was a little high. Her clients may not be in my range. Used the $125 base up to 600 a day in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, man. Don't y'all got some money up there, don't you? I feel like Richmond, Virginia. Maybe I'm just not thinking of the right place, but Richmond, Virginia, as far as I remember, you've got a lot of politicians. You've got a lot of like you've got a high, an insanely high per capita income, including home prices. So, Patrick, uh, if you're in Richmond, Virginia, if I'm correct about where you're at, $125 base is low for Richmond, Virginia. I think so. So, yeah, let me know if it, I, I could just be wrong. I mean, I know there's poor rural areas in Virginia, and I know there's areas of Virginia that are closer to D.C. Uh, that have really high, 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 high housing and high everything. So if you're around there, I think you're going to be fine. You, you need to talk to more than one people. You know, when typically when I've gotten my property managers, I've approached a dozen in order to get one. And six of those dozen just straight up right off the bat. Had I approached any of those six first, and only them and no one else, had I talked to one property manager, 50-50 chance that property manager is offended at my rates. But the other half, they're not offended at my rates. They see my rates as normal, but out of that half that see my rates as normal, they don't need me because they already have a handyman and they don't really need anybody else. So they're not going to throw a wrench in the works. And then the one that I end up acquiring when I go approach a dozen. The one is the one who didn't have a problem with my rates and needed a handyman. And I'll tell y'all something real quick. When a property manager needs a handyman, they need a handyman. I want y'all to go and try to find a handyman who's available on short notice. Short notice meaning the next few days to fix a leaky sink. It is hard to find one that isn't going to charge you $250 to fix your leaky sink in the next couple of days. So for me, for my property managers, it's kind of a deal because, yeah, it's $125 and maybe it only took me 10 minutes. But I'm the guy that once they have me, they have me. It's one of the reasons I don't work for homeowners. It's not just because there's things I don't like about homeowners. It's because 
the way to be the best at what you're doing is to niche down and know who your clients are. So with my business revolving around property managers, I tend to not distract myself from my property management jobs to impress a homeowner that may never call me back when I know my property manager is going to want to call me back soon, like today or tomorrow for yet another job. Daryl, the finisher said, you sound like me. I always say I was a good worker, but a terrible employee. That's, man, Daryl, there was this one time, probably more than once, honestly, but this one time that was stupid absurd. I was working graveyard shift. Now, in aviation, I did avionics, mostly running wires, doing mods. Like, we we tear the aircraft apart, we pull out boxes and wires, and we stall, install all new systems in there. So, it you might work on one plane, for three weeks straight, both shifts, multiple guys per shift, running wires, installing boxes. It's what I've done most of my life. So I'm like, not to toot my own horn, but I'm good at it. Like I'm the guy that they call when they've got one that's out on the flight line. It's 110 degrees outside. And there's one wire that needs to be run. And the area it needs to be run in is impossible to run it in without removing a bunch of boxes. And once you remove those electronic boxes, boom, you kick in all these necessary operational checks. Could be two days worth of ops checks for that one hour of removing a box and running a wire. I'm the guy that ran those wires that could figure out how to do it without moving the box. I'm just saying I was good. I wasn't the best. Other people were better than me, smarter than me, taller than me, all that good stuff. But I could run the shit out of some wires. So what I would do is... If I worked an entire 12-hour shift and actually worked that entire 12-hour shift, I would get what it would take a lot of guys three days of 12-hour shifts to get done. So typically what I would do is I'd work at my own pace. I'd set I'd set my pace. I'd take my breaks when I wanted. I would take my lunch. When, I wouldn't participate in the employee thing that was happening. And there was one night, I don't remember what the conversation was about, but I had a friend call me. And I talked to him on the phone for three hours walking around outside in the dark. And he didn't realize until I said, I better get back in and start running some wires <clears throat> that I was at work on the clock that whole time. I was not a good employee, but I was a good worker. They made profit off of me and I ran more wires per day, per shift than almost anybody else there. It just happened to have been my specialty. So I gave them their money's worth and then I, I took time for myself. Paul said, you were starting to say something regarding Alan Lee's handyman journey when your phone rang. Curious to hear the rest of it. I'm in his Facebook group. Sweet. So, Paul, um, so Alan Lee, somebody who watches my channel commented on one of his videos very recently that he should watch my channel. I think he had mentioned something about property management. So somebody said, hey, you should go watch the Bulletproof Handyman. He's got some good advice for property management. So he did. He commented on a video. I commented back. Um, and then I went ahead and shot him an email and just was like, hey, you know, by the way, blah, 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 blah. I've looked at your channel. And long story short, me and me and Alan Lee had a conversation on the phone this morning. Hold on. This is my son. He's working. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> okay yeah cool yeah yep cool yep i'll send you some gas money right now yes sir i'm doing a live right now so i'm gonna let you go all right love you bye all right, that was my son. Don't worry, I am going to get back to uh, Alan Lee. This was my son. This is another good example. He's doing this uh, because he wants to. We're on a patch and paint in Sarita, which is good 30 minutes south, right? It's a long drive. We can only charge so much while still appearing to be charging reasonably, right? There are certain th a patch and paint could take you six hours, but if you go charge $600 for a patching paint, you're going to look greedy, right? So as I was saying before, some jobs you might charge 125 for and only spend five minutes on. This is one of those where without any extra pay, he's gone back to Sarita today to work more on a patch and paint that we're already maxed out on. We're going to charge like 400 plus materials. 
We've put in way more value than that already, but the problem is the paint is impossible to match. It is a weird brown that just cannot match. The sheen is something in between a eggshell and a satin, I think. It seems like the eggshell... Or is it between a flat and an eggshell? Anyways, the sheen's been impossible to match. We've gotten like five different trips to get this stuff matched, and it just ain't matching. I hear my babies out there. It just ain't matching, um, and he's still working on it. We're just going to do what we have to do, and this is going to be a solid job, and we're going to lose money on it. But we're not going to lose money over the course of the year because by losing money on this job, we maintain a reputation as having fair prices with solid work. You don't need to think about every job as its own individual profit or loss. You need to think of your business on the whole as providing solid work for a good price overall. But with Alan Lee, anyways, what I was saying to Paul was Alan and I had a phone call this morning. Uh, it was a really great phone call, in my opinion. Like we, we serve very different clients, totally different clients. We, as far as marketing, because of his client base, you know, a lot of his business acumen has to do with good marketing, whereas I preach no marketing at all because we're working for property managers. So there's huge differences that you think would be a big chasm. But what it boils down to is he and I are super similar. We have a similar philosophy on life. We have a similar philosophy on business. We're honestly running our businesses in very, very different and yet very, very similar ways. And we most importantly have a very similar view of the handyman industry and where we where we think it's been, where we think it's going, where we're trying to help it get to and where we want to see it go um, because we both want it to be viewed. I'm always talking about like, how would an electrician do it? How would a plumber do it? Why should you do it any different? You also are providing a valuable service that there's very few people out there providing. And if you can do it well, we need to be behaving like them. And, and the way to view how you interact with your customers sometimes is to ask yourself, what would I expect of an HVAC technician? And he also feels that way. He wants to see this industry move to a point where we are treating ourselves as professionals. We're behaving as professionals and we need to start training our clients to view us the same way they would view a, a specialized tradesman because we're also providing a specialized skill. Our specialized skill is that we can do a lot of the different things because everybody else can. It's like I say, your plumber isn't going to fix that outlet. Your electrician isn't going to fix the sink. You know, the, the plumber's going to cut a hole in the wall to fix the plumbing. He's not going to close it. And the drywall guy that closes it can't do the plumbing. We provide a specialized skill that's also in great demand. So I had a really great conversation with him. He's got a lot going on. I'll let him tell you about what his business is and his future and his plans and all of that. But he's got a lot going on right now. I've got a lot going on right now. So we probably talked for an hour, I bet. It, it, it felt fast, but it was a great conversation. So it just felt like it went by fast. I think we put some, some decent time in. Um, but we've got so much more to talk about. So we're trying to figure out the next day to schedule to like sit down and talk more. He's going to dive into some property management. In fact, he's already got that ball rolling before talking to me. But since you all recommended me to him, um, I'm excited to be able to teach him what I know about my end. And I'm also going to go ahead and uh, open up. I'm not going to just start working for homeowners because right now I literally can't. Right now I'm literally... My problem is too much work and not enough time to do the work. So I'm not bringing on new clients today, but I'm going to start listening to him. I'm going to actually, he feels that he has some knowledge to offer me, which I'm certain he does, that is maybe going to help alleviate some of the issues that I have with homeowners. And I've had some of my own ideas for that, that I'm going to run past him. And then I'm going to be super excited if he says, yeah, that's what I was thinking, because I, I respect the guy. He knows what he's doing. He's built a very a bigger business than mine and a more successful business than mine. So we're going to see where we can collaborate, both helping each other individually with our actual businesses, as well as together here on YouTube. So I look forward to that. I think we're going to have fun. I think y'all are going to enjoy it. I think y'all are going to receive a lot of great info from him that you otherwise wouldn't have received from me and vice versa. <clears throat> All right, where are we at? Da, 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 um, 
Greg Pearson said, Greg from Alaska, word got out. I might start doing work, getting lots of calls. Guess I should start the process. Thanks for your help. Excellent channel. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Good luck to you. Do solid work and follow through on what you said. And that's honestly, you're in the top 10th percentile. If you just do solid work and follow through on what you say. Patrick said, no, that's Northern Virginia. We are more affordable. She is just one. I thought she would be better as her office is in the high earner zip code. Well, definitely, Patrick, don't base anything on one property manager or one realtor or one client. Um, if you want to dive into this, the best way to do it is to approach a dozen at a time. Uh, and that's going to automatically weed out the cheap ones. It's going to weed out. It's going to weed out a lot. If you approach a dozen, you should be able to walk away with one. Uh, if you haven't already, go watch my videos for how to approach a property manager. I've got a couple of them, and I do think they're very handy. Do, 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 Matt Trump Power said, caught you live. Just wanted to say you're awesome. Thanks for the inspiration to keep going. Independent electrician in Ohio, you have given me great ideas, and my pricing is bulletproof now. That's awesome, sir. I love hearing. I love more than anything when you guys tell me that something I said or did caused you to enact a change in your life that made something better. My biggest fear when I first started this channel, when I actually started getting some followers who seemed to be saying that they were listening to me, my biggest fear was, oh God, what if I'm wrong? Like, what if I've been lucky and I've succeeded despite being wrong? What if, what if these guys go bankrupt because of me? It really scared me. But over time, I haven't seen, I've seen some guys who just didn't have good luck. But what I really love is when y'all are telling me that I've actually been helpful. I, I enjoy that because it was the, the prime motivation for starting this channel in the first place. My goodness, dude, we're at an hour and 51 minutes. No wonder I'm rocking back and forth and getting all itchy and antsy and wanting to get up and walk around. So guys... Uh, last opportunity. Look, and the viewership's going up. We got 40 people in here now. I'll stay in here. I tell y'all what, come up with your questions. I'm going to go check on my babies. I know they're good to go. They've got a TV. They've got food. They've got milk. I pay tons of attention to them, by the way. Chris Castro said, howdy, homie. Howdy, Chris. I'm going to step out for just a minute and just check on my babies. I know they're good. They've gotten tons of attention, just so y'all know. I don't leave babies for two hours. My wife was here at the beginning She's left. They're safe. You know, I need to do a video and this is how we do things. But I'm going to go check on them. I'll be right back. All right. Well, I have about 150 diapers to pick up off the nursery floor after this live stream, but otherwise their bottles still have milk, their snacks are still good, and they're having a good time. So any other questions at all, now is the time to throw them in. While I'm waiting, I'll talk about my channel description stuff again. I have a uh, newsletter you can sign up for. And by the way, I'm sorry I haven't done a new newsletter lately. I'm trying to do this channel thing. I'm trying to do the business. The holidays are coming up. Just had my wife's birthday. My boy's birthday's coming up in a couple weeks and Halloween, Thanksgiving, etc. I'm really busy. I do apologize. That's not an excuse. I do need to get another uh, newsletter out. But I got really great reception on it. So if y'all want to go to the description, you can sign up for it there. I'm also going to tell you to find me on both Twitter, which is now X. Uh, I just keep calling it Twitter mostly because a lot of people don't know that it's name changed. But you can find me on Twitter. I would appreciate if you do because I need to hit a certain level on Twitter before I get certain features for doing the, uh, what do they call it? Twitter spaces. That's where y'all are going to be able to come in and sort of like be in an audio room with me where we can talk instead of me reading and then responding verbally. You can talk to me and I can talk to you 
Also, same thing on TikTok. I've not done hardly anything. By the way, Twitter is Handyman Hangout. I think you can also search for Bulletproof Handyman. And then TikTok. TikTok has a thing with these lives that I really want to do with y'all where you can split the screen. So like you and I, I could be doing a live and I don't know if you raise your hand or how it works. Cause again, I think I need to have a thousand followers, which isn't a lot, but I don't have hardly any over there. But if a thousand of y'all follow me over there, I could start doing these lives and on the lives you can like request and I can click accept and then split the screen. And there's both of us like video chatting, essentially like a zoom call live on on uh, TikTok. I would really like to do that because I would like to see y'all's faces and hear your voices and I would like the interaction to not be you typing one sentence and then me talking forever. I do like to talk. I like to share. I'm not going to pretend like I don't, but I would rather it be a back and forth than just me talking forever. Hawk, hey, Hawk, I, I I believe, Hawk, you requested that I call you Hawk 999999999990, or did you say just Hawk? I'm pretty sure you wanted me to use all the numbers, right? Uh, missed the show so far. What licensing and insurance do you require for someone to start working for you? I don't require any of it. I do prefer it, and I do let everybody know that when times are good and there's lots of work, I give the work out to everybody I can because I need it getting done. But when times slow down, if I have to start being selective about who gets the work, then I'm going to be sending the work to the people who do have their own independent business with an LLC, with insurance, with all of that good stuff, because that's the behavior that I want to promote. And of course, my insurance may or may not cover work that they do on a property if something goes wrong. Although, just to be clear, guys, uh, you all need to get insurance. Oh, and in my description, there's a link to uh, Next Insurance. That's the insurance that I have my liability coverage for my business with. I think they're all mostly the same. There are some that are cheaper. That are There are some that are more expensive. In the end, you basically get what you pay for. But I want to reiterate something I've said once before, and I probably haven't said enough. Do not assume that your insurance is ever going to actually cover what it needs to cover. They are experts at getting out of paying the money that they need to pay. I don't know this from personal experience, but I know this from the experience of others. Uh, you do need to have it. I recommend getting better rather than worse. Essentially, the price you're paying, in my opinion, has mostly to do with, let's say next is uh, going to run you maybe 100 to 150 a year. and you can assign a percentage there, you know, I don't know, 37% likely to pay out when they should. And then you've got another one that's going to be 98 a year. They're cheaper. They're also one of the reasons they get themselves cheaper is they're better at not paying, right? And then the expensive ones, hypothetically, are going to be even better at paying because they're charging a premium because they are paying out more and they want that reputation. Where are we at? Chris Castro said, just want to say you really changed my life, but I started a year ago thinking I'd make a few hundred a month. Now my wife doesn't work and just helps out with the admin work. It's been good for me. That's my favorite thing to hear. And I especially love that your wife doesn't have to work. Um, a lot of people would disagree with me on this, and I don't really care what people think about this. To me, women are very special, right? I'm not a simp. I'm, I'm the opposite of a simp, but part of who I am is... Women have babies, and that is amazing. Women are the only beings on earth that can bring new human beings into this world. And I may be, uh, I'm a little skewed because I had an amazing mom, still have an amazing mom. And I mean an amazing mom. My mother sacrificed so much for me. She was absolutely amazing and still is amazing to this day. Some women can suck. Some individual women can suck. But I believe that women are special, and I believe we should be opening doors for them. We should be providing for them. We should be protecting them. And if you know some that don't deserve that, that's fine, that some don't deserve that. But my default is that that's what women deserve. That's what women should have, because they are the beautiful beings that know how to love so much more than men know how to love. And they bring the beauty and the art and all of those things into this world. So when somebody tells me that their wife now gets to stay home, whether they're taking care of kids or not, just the fact that you can provide for your wife 
hopefully she's a good wife who earns that and who deserves it. Um, but regardless, I'm very happy to find out that men are more able to provide for their family because something I said allowed them to, to bring something up a level to that next level. So I really like hearing that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Dominic said, thanks, Ray. I've been working on, <clears throat> on adding in commercial property work. Going great. Big jump in income. I thank you for your insights. Keep it going, Nick in Southern Maine. Thank you, sir. Again, uh, there's nothing better that y'all can do for me than to just let me know that I've been helpful because that gives me a lot of pride and motivation uh, to keep doing this and to put even more into it. Matt Trumpower said, do property managers look for handymen exclusively in your opinion, or is there a market I could potentially tap into? I have worked for property managers before, but callbacks from them are low. Matt, I forget. Are you an electrician? Because you asked, do they look for... Yeah, you are. You're the independent electrician in Ohio. Yeah, Matt, uh, all property managers would like to have an electrician. I will tell you... In my opinion, in the property manager world, the types of people they need to assign work out to, the highest paid is going to be general contract. Well, just contract. Just say anybody with a contractor's license. There are levels. There's general. There's multiple levels of general. And then there's specialty licenses beneath that. Um, the highest paid ones are the contractors that they use very rarely. And they honestly, the reason they have handymen is so they don't have to pay contractors because as much as people think that handyman rates are too high, if you saw what contractors were charging, which you probably have if you're an electrician, it's insane. So under contractors, next is handyman. We make the second most. We charge almost as much as contractors. And when I say we, I mean those of us running a serious business like I do. There are some chucks in a truck, and they're happy to toss them some smoke detectors and stuff. And I hope that those guys do work their way up that ladder as well. I don't want to see anybody stay there because I think we're all capable of doing more. Um, but so you have contractors and then handymen are second. Right underneath the handymen, I'm going to lump in HVAC, plumbing, and electrical. Um, it's not that those guys are worth less. Like a certified electrician servicing homeowners, depending on who your clients are, you can make more than a handyman. Overall, generally speaking, but for a property manager, typically they have found one plumbing company. And by company, I mean it's a guy with a helper. One electrical company, one HVAC company. Of Those three, I find that even though I'm charging $125 trip fees, a lot of these guys are telling me they're charging $85 or $95 or $100. And I think the reason is because they're kind of guaranteed all the work. So they basically have said, look, I'll, I'll have a lower trip fee for you if you send me a decent amount of work, but those property managers, they can find HVAC guys that are stable long-term at a good price. They can find electricians and plumbers that are also like that. Handyman is the world where they just can't, by the way, if you see that, I cut the shit out of my finger the other day. This entire thing is ripped deep. If you're wondering what that is. Um, so I'm going to say you may or may not be able to charge the same trip fee, but yes, they need electricians. They would like to have electricians very badly uh, because electricians are expensive. And what they're looking for is somebody who's going to give them a very nice uh, trip fee, a low trip fee rate. So if you approach them with a $100 trip fee, you can still charge more than $100. But it's the fact that your trip fee is 100 or lower that they're hoping most of the jobs you do are going to be like quick, like, like me. When they send me to figure out an outlet that's not working... Most of the time, it's because somebody stabbed it instead of putting it under the actual screw there. Um, I, th I think stabbing, I hope you'd agree, stabbing them in the back is the worst way to do it. And it's usually a stab type. And I literally just cut that shit off, restrip the wire, put it on correctly, and everything works fine. Or it's some other really simple, fast troubleshooting. Um, but that's what they're looking for, and they do want electricians. Here we go. Adam Connor in Toronto, Canada said, I just got business insurance today from Zensurance. Took 15 minutes. One year policy was 700, including tax. That's cool. I will look into them. Like I said, I mean, the prices are everywhere. From what I can tell, the less you pay, the less likely they are to take care of you if you actually need them to. 
And the more you pay, the more likely they are. And then customer service and stuff changes. Um, but yeah, as far as I'm concerned, if y'all just get some insurance from somebody, that's the best thing. And I do next insurance because they seem to be the most commonly used by handymen. Chris said, I'm still just one person doing the work and can't fathom hiring anybody. Was it hard to trust another person to do good work? Any regrets? Yeah, Chris, it was extremely hard. I still don't like letting anybody else do my work. And um, they do shit work most of the time, and I've regretted almost every one of them. However, I have found that by having this channel, I have had... So I've got one guy, the first guy off of this channel... The first and only time I've been recognized in public, this guy walked up to me at Home Depot and said, do you have a YouTube channel? Long story short, he's got his own handyman business here. He was previously doing exactly what I do in Colorado, so he doesn't need a lot of work from me, and he can't jump on my jobs very quickly because he has his own clients, but we work very well together, and I'll send him very important work that I need to get done correctly. He has the reputation with me that I try to have with my property managers. My son is learning, but my son doesn't hack things, so he doesn't know it all yet. In fact, he's still very much so a beginner, but he's putting in the time and the effort to learn and to try and to he's willing to lose a little money in order to gain the experience so that he can get better and better at it. Um, I got another new guy from this channel. He's only done two jobs for me. He changed all the outlets in a house. And then he also did a very small move out for me that I had already estimated. And he did a good job as far as I can tell. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, every time somebody new comes along, it's so stressful because most of them suck. You know, and it's it's not that they're bad people. They're just they choose to not do the best job, not even the best job they can do. They 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 just choose to not put that little extra in to make sure it's solid. And it's the examples are such that I know they knew better. You know, it wasn't like they tried their hardest and they thought it was good. I go look at their work and it's obvious to me that there was a glaring mistake there that they didn't fix. And they tried to cover up, hoping nobody would notice. And you just can't work for me if you do that. <clears throat> Matt said, spot on, brother. A woman makes a home. A man makes a house. That's exactly right. You know, there's people who believe that way and there's people who don't. And I don't mind the people who don't. But I do. I, my wife raises my babies, and I know for a fact she treats them better, she loves them more, and she takes better care of them than anybody else ever would, because she's their mother. Dominique said, thank you for your comments on women. My wife recently stopped working to take care of grandbabies. I consider her a Proverbs 31 woman. I'm not religious, Dominic, so I don't know Proverbs 31. Um but women are the most beautiful thing in the world. The good ones are anyways. And if that's what you've got, I couldn't imagine like just how amazing it would be to get to the point where my wife gets to take care of grandbabies all day. She's already an amazing mother. And I can't imagine how great she's going to be by the time she's a grandmother. Matt said, uh, thank you for the insight. I will adjust for the next property manager I get. The potential for more work is better. Uh, backstabbing is the worst. I agree, sir. Rambler said, hi, opinions on those thick rubber gloves for electrical. <laughs> so uh, my electricians can chime in here. Maybe Matt can chime in here. Uh, this is going to sound crazy. And I've had people tell me that I shouldn't even admit this to anybody on my channel because I'm going to be liable, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you something. Y'all are all adults and I'm an adult and I'm not responsible for what choices you make and you're not responsible for what choices I make. When I work on electrical, as long as it's 120, when I'm working on 120, I just go ahead and shock myself. I do. If I've got an outlet to change, if I'm on the floor already, just stuck the tester in, pull it out from the wall a little bit, I see the loose wire, I fix the thing myself. If I'm changing an outlet, if it's cracked and I've got the new outlet, and my two choices are go find a circuit breaker panel and figure out which one goes to this outlet and turn it off, or take a shot at shocking myself, but just go ahead and change it. I've been in electronics my whole life on aircraft. I, I know where the hot wire is. I know where the ground is. I know what may or may not shock me or should or shouldn't shock me. But most importantly, I know that when an outlet shocks me with 120 volts, it doesn't hurt. It's a shock, like it's a shocking experience. But when I'm doing it, and it's rare, it's maybe one out of 10, 
I'll accidentally <laughs> touch the wrong thing. And when I do, I just <clears throat> like that a little bit and I keep going because the truth is it doesn't. Now you're going to hear, and this is true, according to somebody, it's a, a fact that I was taught in aviation that only takes 0 0.015 milliamps to stop your heart. So that's why I say y'all are all adults. You make your own decisions. None of your decisions about safety need to be based on how safe I choose to be with myself. But I don't mind getting shocked one single bit. I was building cabinets and installing them when I was 14 years old with my stepdad. And I had to put all the outlets into the backsplashes. And he would be the one turning off the breakers. And he'd get mad if I questioned whether he got the breakers off. And I didn't have a multimeter. And I got shocked enough at 14 that by the time I was an adult and joining the Air Force, I already didn't mind getting shocked. It just doesn't bother me a bit. It's not a big deal to me. So I don't take any precautions whatsoever other than to make sure that I'm trying to touch things in the correct places and or use tools that have well insulated handles. But I shock myself on one out of 10 electrical jobs and it doesn't bother me a bit. Chris said, I found that a lot of service work people don't understand the long term of working with a property manager. You can charge $350 for one job or $100 for 1,000 jobs. It helps thinking big picture. Let me read that again. I'm starting to get tired from talking for so long. I found that a lot of service work people don't understand the long term of working with the PM. You can charge three. Yes, there we go. Yes, this is something I say a lot. You're always, you're trying to set your rates, not at the most you can get for this job, because you can screw people easily. Everybody's desperate. If you want to just go gouge people, you can do that every day until the market drops out from under you, and then you can't gouge anybody. If you go to a property manager or a realtor or anybody who provides you with steady business, or if you find a neighborhood where everybody likes you, whatever the scenario is, when your pricing is right, you don't screw yourself, you don't screw the client, and everyone is happy in such a way that you all want to continue working with each other, potentially for decades. So charge your charge your property managers just simply a fair rate, nothing more, nothing less. A good fair rate that accounts for your value, and your value is very high, it's a high rate. But just charge a fair rate that accounts for your value without trying to screw people, and you will gain loyalty over time you will be the only person they want to send work to manuel manuel said must be a velvet sheen yeah probably i don't i don't know man and i know like sherwin williams and dunn edwards and all these guys they've all got like their own custom sheen so if you don't know what that house was painted with 20 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago if you don't even know what it was painted with good luck getting that sheen right Rambler said Klein insulated electrical screwdrivers from Lowe's. Good quality. Uh, I've never, it seems to me that all of my screwdrivers are well insulated and I've never bought any that were particularly marketed as being insulated. Like my, my plastic craftsman's are insulated. My rubber, uh, what's the Home Depot brand that I'm just brain farting on right now? Husky. My rubber Huskies apparently are well insulated. They all seem to be insulated. But again, I just don't worry about shocking myself. I just go ahead and get shocked. Rico said I was gone for a minute. That 645 was only labor. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's a decent price then, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Rico is basically saying the 645 we were talking about, that was only labor. That, that's a fair price. I mean, I, it's one of those things where I'll say, I feel like you could charge more, and I feel like I probably would have charged more, although not a lot more. But again, our goal is not charge more, charge more, charge more. If you create a happy client who feels that they they paid you a fair wage for doing what you did, and if you were happy to work for them and they were happy for you to do the work, then over time, you're going to develop a relationship with them and you're going to be their go-to guy. And it's not going to matter if you got rich on this job or didn't. What's going to matter is that you have long-term clients and you don't have to invest so much of your time into seeking new clients. Matt said, God bless. Have a great night, family time. All right. That sounds good, Matt. You have a great night too. Rambler said, I think during the recession, people are not fixing their homes. I 100% agree with that. Chris said, when I see other people work, it feels like they just have a completely different standard than me. 
I think I know what you mean. If you're saying they don't have standards, you're probably correct, sir. Exploring Doran R. Brown said, I started a mobile e-bike repair business two years ago, and several months ago I started offering handyman services to bike customers. When I finished, I ended up working on their houses, appliances, and cars. That's pretty badass, man. That's that's a good way to get some clients. Vikan R. Mujian said, Hi, Ray. Finally, I caught you live. I love your channel. I learned a lot from you. I started... I started for homeowners, and now I got my first property manager. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome, sir. Exploring Door and R. Brown said, I wonder if there's a business in offering a full-service mechanic handyman, or am I trying to do too much that I won't be able to get good enough and quick to charge high rates? It's a question I've entertained before. I feel like what it takes to be a great mechanic and what it takes to be a great handyman, I feel like might be too much. But honestly, sir, I feel like what you really need to do, is if you feel like you're a good mechanic, see, I'm not a good mechanic. I will work on my own stuff, depending on what it is. And I will also send stuff to my brother-in-law, depending on what it is. But I try not to work with the family because I don't want him to feel pressure to give, to give me priority, right? I want his business to succeed based on how he runs it without me being in the way so I'll hire other mechanics as well. I feel like I'm not a good enough a mechanic to know, but I do think that if I thought I was great at being a mechanic already, and if I think I'm great at being a handyman already, I do think that there is a place for, let's say, a handyman, not a handyman mechanic. I think there's a place for a handyman who can let his clients know, by the way, one of the services I offer is certain services on certain types of vehicles and just make that part of your handyman package. I don't think I'd sell myself as a mechanic because number one, I think mechanics can make even more depending on where you're at. But I also think that if you're good at being a mechanic, you can build something bigger and better just being a mechanic or just being a handyman than you can spreading yourself around too thin. But I don't know that answer, though. I really don't. That's not a uh, hard-held opinion of mine. And I think that if you want to try that out, uh, again, be the man in the arena. Put the word out. See what happens. And if it doesn't work, put the word out that you're no longer doing that. And please do let me know how it succeeds or doesn't succeed. Explorin said, I'm setting up my handyman business now and I'm going to get to and I'm going to go get some property managers based on all your advice. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I, I hope you do well with that. And if you don't, I have no doubt that if you stay in the arena and you keep trying, you will find your niche and the way that you're going to succeed. Chris said, it said, since you started the channel, do you have a better idea of what you would charge if you live somewhere else? Could 125 apply everywhere? Would you like to work in a different market? Um, no, I mean, like, Chris, if I was in my hometown of San Angelo, Texas, where damn near every grown man in that town is expected to know how to use a few tools and fix a few things, which is not the case here at all, I think if I was in my hometown, I might have to charge an $85 trip fee. But if I was in my hometown... Houses would cost one-third what they cost here. Groceries are cheaper. Gas is cheaper. Everything's cheaper in my hometown. So, no, I wouldn't say 125 would apply everywhere. In fact, I would say that 125 I would apply to any city, let's say, population 200,000, all the way up to maybe a million. Make you go over a million. And guys, like, I'm talking out my ass here. I really am. I'm trying to give you the best answer I can. Um, and hopefully coming across very blatantly not pretending to know that this is the answer. I think when you go under 200,000 ballpark, you're probably going to need to come down from that 125 because you're going to be in a more rural, less developed area full of grown men who know how to fix things. So the demand is going to be lower. I also think when you get over 1 million population, and you can easily charge more than 125 at, at 800,000 or whatever. I'm just saying, I think when you hit a million population, you're definitely in a position where 125 is too low. But again, that's going to always change everywhere you go. And the only way to know for sure is make the best guess you can, err on the side of being too cheap starting out. But as soon as you get started, 
if you're not getting any pushback on prices, you immediately start bumping those prices up and you keep them bumping up, not until people get pissed, you bump them up until your good clients start giving you a little pushback. And a little pushback just means they ask a few extra questions or they seem slightly concerned about the price. And if you can keep your price right below where you start getting questions, I believe that puts you at the top of near the top of the window without being at the top of the window. That's my answer to that. And I don't know if I'm right. I don't want to be pretending like I think I'm right all the time. <sighs> Next, uh, Rico said, yeah, and that was only half of her to-do list. The rest was inside work for almost double that in labor. I hope I get it. All my other customers accepted immediately, so I'm just being impatient. Yeah, take your time, sir. Um, you know, just be honest with yourself and be honest with your numbers as you figure out where you should be. Understand that you're going to fail and be wrong sometimes. And, uh, you know, whatever you do, don't go chasing her. You know, don't call her up after one day of not hearing back and offer to drop your price. Just give her some time. Uh, I say two to three days, you know, just send a text message, just a follow-up text message. And just say, hey, it's just reaching out to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, you know, if you're still thinking on that estimate, that's perfectly fine. And if you've made a decision, please let me know. But don't be pushy and let her come around in her time. And Chris Castro said, I understand. And guys, it's two and a half hours now. I feel like I really need to get off of here. My babies are good to go, but they have been essentially in their, you know, safe room slash nursery entertaining each other for a little while. And I really need to go spend some time with them. I'm going to take this last one. I've been charging $60 an hour for a year, but recently started experimenting with flat rate and charging about 70 to 80 an hour based on how long I think it will take. I need advice on tuning rates. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, it depends on your area. Uh, 70 to 80 an hour is kind of low. If it works for you, it works for you, but you definitely can charge more. No, I don't think people tipping you is a sign that you should charge more. Um, I think the people who tip are doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. It could be a sign of that. I do tip. I had a drywall guy that worked on my house that refused to let me... I told him he I needed I wanted to pay him 200 a day because he said 100 for the whole day and I knew that was absurd and I said man you need to charge way more and he refused to charge more so I gave him I said can I at least give you a tip at the end of the day and he's like fine man you can give me a tip but my price is my price so at the end of the day I gave him a $100 tip if that's happening then yes that means you're not charging enough but otherwise uh there are just still some kind people in this world, and I wouldn't base my rates on the frequency of tips. Uh, however, I would play with my rates, and I would try to bring them up unless you know that you're at the top uh, of the window, near the top of the window in your area. All right, Donnie said, afternoon, Ray, such great information. Thank you, sir. Uh, guys, I am going to get off of here. I really need to go be with my babies for a little while. I love you all. I'm glad you all showed up. Thank you for showing up. I will see you on the next one. I hope you all are all out there 